I thought Tammy was on. There's Patrick. Wow. AG Barr is resigning. Tammy's on and her mic is on, but we can't hear okay. her. Wow. Really? Oh, there's Tammy. There's Patrick and Wendy. Colin just told us great news. <laughs> Barr is resigning. Yeah. Yeah. He is. Yeah. Oh my God. He resigns. Oh, well, now he may as well write it out. Exactly. <laughs> Everybody. I'm sure he would have fi- he would have fired him anyway. So what the hell, you know? Minor sign. One okay. day before leave office. Okay. All right, guys. Let's let let's get back. Let's get back to decor because we got to get one. Yep. Sorry, here I am, the, the tap master again. Okay. I do miss being in person where you could chat for five minutes before we start the meeting. So I appreciate everybody being here. It is um, still some people and board members in the attendee section. Um, so keep monitoring that. I think Diana said we had a quorum, Tammy, so we could right, let's rock. get started. I think um, Alice may need to so sign late. off and back on. Is nope, Alice, I think Alice not in? Okay. She's here, but she's having some technical troubles. I think she needs to sign off and back on so her audio connects. So I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Alice. Awesome. Be, I'm I'm here. I'm just taking a. I'll be right. Back. Okay. But we can go ahead and get started, right? I mean, we she's here. Give it a shot. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm going to kick it off. Um, welcome to. Um, our December land use meeting. Uh, we only have one topic for discussion, and that is the um, Governor's Island, um, uh, the Governor's Island um, discussion that we began, we had last um, last month. Um, I am kicking it off because Patrick is here, but he had to accuse himself. So I am going to um, uh, start the meeting, kick it off um, with, um, and I'll have to tag team. I'll just acknowledge it up front. I'm gonna tag team with Tammy uh, since she has far more experience in this than I do. And I, we, need, we need to get through a lot of material this evening. And besides, I left my notes at the office, so I'm not good at winging it. Um, so, uh, in addition to me, um, Tammy, Alice, Patrick, we have the, our, our, um, folks from Governor's Island. I know I saw Sarah on the line and I, I believe Claire's on the line as well. Yes, hi everybody. Okay, great. Great. Okay. So, you know, we're here to discuss your application for the zoning changes, as you know. Um, so there's specifically a couple of items that we're going to discuss the um, it, the zoning map amendment change to um, extend the special governor's island district to the southern section of the governor's island, of governor's island um, and to rezone um, the district within the south island to a different district. Um, the I'm looking at my notes, <laughs> um, which I can't read. The um, text amendment modifies the original article um, to establish the existing special government island district um, at the North Island subdistrict and the special governor's island district to establish a new South Island district um, of the that will consider the east sub area and the western sub area, open space sub area, and um, will provide new provisions. To the South Island subdistrict. Okay, we met last. The last time we met, we we met last month, um, November 9th. Um, the public had an opportunity to weigh in on these plans, um, and we had a bunch of questions for you guys. Um, we have had some responses, but. Um, I think we there's still uh, um, a number of things that we have questions on. Uh, so with that, um, I guess we should go ahead and get started. Tammy, do you have anything specific that you wanted to add? 
I want to add that the goal tonight is that we get to resolution. So, what does that mean for our board? Right, our board means that we're going to do a little bit of Q and A in the beginning. I hope you've all read the information that was sent out as well as the links to the public comment. We did have more public comment get uploaded today. I do know that um, Diana, if you can drop that into the chat, if people want to review it 1 more time, that would be great. Um, whatever we do here, we vote by the land use and then we will do a. A vote at the full board if you have. Any questions tonight is the, the night to ask them. We do have the trust here, but it really is not about Q and a tonight. It really is about. Our response to the zoning to get answers in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that note, um. Do you want to take it back and go through. Where we're going on it. Fern. Yeah, uh, there are a couple of um, there are a couple of um, questions that we had that are outstanding, and I'm trying to find them on my laptop because I printed it. I'll, I'll keep. All right. So the goal for tonight, remember, we're talking about the zoning changes to permit development in the eastern and western sub areas. With up to 4.2, 4.2 million square feet of floor area and limit the remaining portions of the South Island to public open space, recreational water dependent and related uses. All right, specifically, there's 2 actions that we're talking about tonight, which is the zoning map amendment to extend the special governor's island district to the southern section of the island and to rezone the R32 district to a C41, and we'll go over all the details with that. Also, the zoning text amendment modifies Article 13, Chapter 4 to establish the existing Special Governor's Island District as a North Island subdistrict for, for the Special Governor's Island District. So it establishes a new South Island subdistrict compromised of an Eastern subarea, a Western subarea, open space subarea. And to provide new provisions applicable to the southern island. Okay, we've had the trust here several times in the last couple of months. City planning formally certified this on October 19th, which means our 60 day clock for review is already running. All right, the deadline that we have to give our formal rec um, recommendation on the application was extended because our full board vote is December 22nd. Okay, we've already held our public hearing. We have public testimony that was uploaded through today. And then there will be additional opportunities for people to testify for the public if they have not done so thus far through the borough president's office and as well as the New York City City Council hearing. Okay, this meeting tonight is really just for the members of the committee to discuss. Vote on formal recommendations and resolution regarding the application. All right, Diana, do you have the DCP form that you can display? Uh, sure, give me one moment. So while Diana's getting it, I want everybody to see the form so we know where we're going. There are four general ways that you can characterize anything on a resolution on a land use application. Yes, just flat yes. No. Yeah, we don't we don't agree a yes with conditions or a no with conditions. So the difference between a yes with conditions and a no with conditions is really difficult for people to keep in mind, but it's important to take a look at this as we're going along. Okay, and we'll have those topics about yes and no after we get all the individual things worked out. I think is probably the best as we get down. Okay. Um. Okay. Okay. Anna, if you've got that to show, and then I do. This is the first time we're doing it online. Uh, so give me one moment. I'll share my screen. If not, I always can. So just let me know. This is the submission form. So a favorable, yes. Conditional, favorable, yes. With conditions. 
unfavorable, that's a no, or conditional unfavorable, that's a no unless. And people should really understand we've done these both these types of resolutions before for the city and we will do it for land use. Okay. All righty. So but Tammy, just, just to be clear, like a no would just revert it to the previous zoned build out, which still had development on those two in those two areas, correct? Yes. Okay. And that doesn't mean, I mean, a no could send it back to the, you know, a no and less could send it back to the trust to make changes and then come back. Uh, Andrew, you've got your hand up. Do you have a hand up for questions about process? Very quick question. So, sure. I believe we have waterfront and parks and environment, environmental on this. What is yeah. our role in the Q and A and any voting to be done? So, we wanted to include all of the committees in the input process because it's so many committees. Only land use will vote tonight, but we want to make sure that we're as inclusive as we can be for all of the perspectives of, of the other committees. So we're trying to wrap them all together in this and then everybody but votes at the full board. So it'll be a committee vote for land use with participation by the other two, not um, vote. And I had one basic question, but I don't know if we're in that Q&A yet. Yet, because we've got some, we would like the trust to go first. Got it. Um, and uh, we have been back and forth with the trust sending questions back and forth since we distributed information on Friday. We get some answers today, I think, Diana. And then let's go through that, Andrew. And if your questions still have not been answered, then we'll go there. Susan, can you Thanks. wait? Thanks. Absolutely, no worries. Thanks, Susan. Do you need to go now or do you need to wait? I, I just want to ask a procedural question on this. Sure. Uh, um, is this a little bit like the SLA? If you are yeah. unfavorable um, uh, or if you don't at least qualify it, they make the decision without you. Do you understand what I'm saying? If it is a little, it is a little bit like that. Um, okay. It is. If you say a no, unless. Not. It still gives them places to come back. Okay. That I, I don't vote today, but I just wanted to get that clear. Thank you. Gotcha. You're welcome. Rosa, is it a process question of something so far? Or can you wait till Diana gets through the question? A process question about the voting. Um, sure. Thing in the in the rules for the uniform land use review procedure, it says that the community board must state that its conditional approval shall be considered a negative recommendation um, for the purposes of charter section blah blah. If conditions that it considers essential to minimize land use review. Um, environmental impacts are not adopted by the commission. So that is that specifically a vote no with conditions or do you understand what I'm saying? Is that a voting no with conditions that would then turn it to a yes if satisfied? Is that yes. an Yes. Okay, and that was one of the options that you gave. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I see no more process questions. So Diana, take it away. It, uh, I'm sorry, are you asking me to read the responses that we received today to the remaining questions? Um, okay. Let's see, I'll pull it up on my screen. In addition to that, Diana, would it be, it, is you know would um, Sarah or uh, be able Sarah to Sarah or Claire should be able to elaborate. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes, so sir. read the responses. Maybe we'll go. Uh, do you want me to go one by one, given the size here? Yes, please. Okay, great. So these are remaining questions that we've had based on the last couple of months. We've we've uh, had questions going back and forth, uh, and this was the latest batch. Maybe the last. We'll see. 
um, let's see, based on concerns that have been raised through engagement with CB1 and the wider community in the last months, is the trust actively working on any changes to proposed zoning? And the trust response is the trust takes feedback from the community board and the broader community very seriously, given the diversity of voices and opinions expressed in multiple public meetings held with the community board on the zoning proposal since September. The community board's forthcoming resolution and recommendations are the formal vehicle for synthesizing the community board's feedback and putting forth those specific concerns and suggestions in a cohesive manner. The trust looks forward to receiving the final recommendations from the community board and will evaluate what changes can be made, balancing both the feedback from other stakeholders in the process and the important policy goals of the proposed zoning. Does anybody have any questions on that? I think that's pretty clear. It tells us why we're here tonight is to do the feedback. Go for it. Keep okay. going, Diana. Next question, where does the idea for the need for financial sustainability originate, is it in the deed or another document slash plan? The response is, Governor's Island is a complex project and has fundamentally different challenges from building and operating park alone. Over two miles of coastline, the need to restore and renovate over 1 million square feet across 50 individual historic buildings, the need to invest in and maintain its utility and transportation infrastructure, and provide the actual transportation along with security, telecom, and other municipal-like services. Given that complexity, creating and maintaining a pathway to financial self-sufficiency was always an important condition for the state and city when contemplating taking over responsibility for the island from the federal government, specifically to prevent the island's future operating maintenance and development costs from creating a permanent burden on already stretched local tax resources. Future mixed use development was similarly envisioned by the community of advocates that champion the transfer of the island from federal to local control to support expanded use of the island, year round public access, and to fund preservation of the many historic assets. As such, the deed requirements and restrictions created. I'm sorry, give me one second. I need to mute somebody. Um, actually, Tammy, can I pass host to you so I don't sure. interrupt it in these? Gotcha. Thank you. As such, the deed requirements and restrictions created and passed on by the federal government contemplated development on the island and added the requirement that all revenues generated on the island be used to support the island. Consistent with this initial goal, all master planning of the island since the transfer of ownership by both the GIPEC and later the trust has consistently contemplated ground up development opportunities along with the reactivation of the historic buildings to support this path to financial self-sufficiency. The mandate to reach financial self-sufficiency remains a fundamental goal of the New York City, of the City of New York and the Board of the Trust. And the critical importance of this goal has been underscored by the unprecedented fiscal situation the city is facing due to the COVID pandemic. Keep going. If I don't see hands up, we'll keep going. Great. Next question. Can you provide detailed financial modeling showing the minimum level of development needed to achieve financial sustainability? The response, detailed financial projections of this proposal have been provided to the community board as per described in the environmental impact statement. Our proposed development program includes a mix of academic hospitality, office cultural, amenity retail, and trust maintenance uses, only uses permitted and required by the deed. The modeling takes into account the following, the financial projections use industry standard forecasting methodology, taking into account both reasonable projections of future revenues and the reasonable expenses required to operate the island year round, as well as a capital reserve. Next point, the projections assume revenues from approximately 1.3 million gross square feet on the North Island, renovating and tenanting the existing historic buildings and 4.5 million gross square feet of new construction on the South Island from a mix of academic, hospitality, office, cultural and amenity retail uses. Next point, projected revenue assumptions take into account a range of comparable project types and associated costs, adaptive reuse renovation of existing buildings on the North Island for ground space leases and ground up development on the South Island through ground leases. 
Next, the ground lease rents have uh, the ground lease rents assumed for the North Island take into account the high costs associated with adaptively reusing those structures. Next, projected rents were developed from existing leases on the island, appraisals, discussions with brokers, market reports, and comparables research, including both ground leases and sales. Next, revenues from ferry fares and fees from seasonal vendors are also included in addition to grants funding, fundraising, and event proceeds. Next, expense projections account for an increase in costs for year-round operation, an increase in public use of the island, an expanded on-island tenant base and inflation, and finally, Capital reserve projections assume an average annual amount of funds needed to cover future capital maintenance requirements for utilities, transportation infrastructure, building repair with inflation. It's important to note that based on insight from previous marketing and past RFPs for Governor's Island, the need for a clear vision and anchor tenant is key to generate demand for a mix of uses that would put the trust on a reasonable path of financial self-sufficiency. As previously stated, we believe that we could achieve financial self-sufficiency still with a reduction of approximately 500,000 square feet of development on the South Island, but that reduction would also eliminate contingency slash cushion in a long-term plan with significant market uncertainty. We are happy to answer specific questions on the financial projections shared. So, Diana, was there... The question that we asked was there detailed financial modeling of the alternative options or minimum options, for example, what was presented in 2013? Was that received? Um, uh, no, uh, not specifically. We received this response um, in our request for further pro forma or the detailed financial models. No, we haven't received that level of detail. Okay, thank you. Would you like me to go on? Yes, please. Okay. Next question. Can you provide Sorry. details? Sorry, I have my hand up. I don't know if it's on that point, if it's an appropriate spot, or if I should wait to the end. Mm, how many more questions do we have, Diana? A little bit. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. I'm six. happy to wait. I'm happy to wait. Andrew, write it down and wait so we can get through all of it, and we'll try and do all key, all questions at the end, okay? Got it. Thank you. Okay, next. Can you provide detailed fiscal modeling, including for the 2013 master plan with a third lesson density for how that can work to make the island self-sustaining? It was presented as an alternative in the environmental review, but never shown as an option to the community. The response during the 2013 North Island rezoning, the trust did not create a financial model incorporating South Island development because at the time there was no specific plans or proposals for the South Island. The 2013 supplemental generic environmental impact statement, that's SGEIS, clearly indicates that assumptions for South Island development were included as placeholders and plans for the South Island would be developed in later phases. As required through the environmental review process, the impacts of an alternative development scenario was studied. The trust studied the previously identified scenario for the South Island, which was based on the only available reasonable benchmark for South Island development, the scale of the previous Coast Guard facilities. As outlined in the DEIS, the alternative scenario would not make the island financially self-sustaining, nor would it achieve other important benefits of the proposed project. This reasoning included in the DEIS states, under the 2013 alternative, the important public benefits associated with the proposed project would be significantly, significantly less or unachievable. Under the 2013 alternative, it is unlikely the island would develop into a 24-7 neighborhood given the lack of enlivening cultural spaces, more limited food concessions, and amenity retail uses that are anticipated in the proposed project. As a result, it would be difficult to attract an academic anchor tenant under the 2013 alternative, as these prospective tenants see these amenity uses as requirements for their respective student, faculty, and employee populations. As a result, both the university research, research option and mixed use option in the 2013 FSGEIS would fail to meet the goals and objectives of the proposed project in that neither would one create the mix of uses that would 
but would be required to attract a major academic anchor tenant Two, allow for the development of significant office uh, and research and development space associated with and resulting from a major academic anchor. Nor three, provide the resulting economic development and job creation benefits to the city that would result from the proposed project. Furthermore, as rent generating uses such as hotel research and development, commercial office, food and beverage and amenity retail uses are limited under the 2013 alternative compared to the proposed project, the trust would not generate the financial resources from rental income to fund the adequate maintenance and care for the island's more than 100 acres of public open space and its historic resources or to the significantly increase the frequency of ferry service and public access to the island. It is anticipated that the reduced density and opportunity for development under this alternative would leave the trust unable to attract critical tenants to the South Island development zones and unable to create the critical mass of commercial demand to attract tenants to invest in vacant North Island historic buildings. Is that it? Yes, for that question. All righty. Um, are we done with all the questions? No, we have a handful left. Keep going. Let's just okay. plow through. Continue? Okay. And community community board members are smart enough; they can write down their questions so they can ask it at the end. I love, your, I love your confidence. Next question: Is there a rationalization for the from twenty forty to twenty fifty? Does it relate to the sunset of the deed restrictions? The large increase in projected revenue from 2040 to 2050 is in relation to reasonable assumptions related to the phasing of the project, where many of the commercial and R&D uses attracted by the university anchor come online in later years of the projected horizon. This underscores the point made in the previous question that market research and previous efforts by the trust have clearly indicated the need to establish a vision and attract an anchor tenant to attract and unlock other uses and efforts to add North Island tenants. Uses prohibited by the deed are not included in the financial projections. Next question. How does the academic user who pays no tax weigh financially versus other users? With permanent residential uses restricted by the deed and based on a decade of RFP experience trying to attract tenants, the trust feels strongly that an anchor institution is required to drive interest from businesses and other uses to locate on the island and generate rental revenue. The trust's goal is to identify a mission aligned academic or research institution to balance need to celebrate and complement the island's unique character. Fulfill the requirement for educational use on the island and drive interest in demand for other uses to support the goal of generating revenue to support the island's operations and expanded access. When developing this proposal and the vision for Center for Climate Solutions, this trust studied successful, comparable places across the country. Attracting an impactful academic anchor institution will be necessary to capture revenue through related commercial activity and create the vibrant year round community and vision for the island with supporting cultural and amenity uses. And then a sub question. The footnote about being similar to Cornell tech is troubling Cornell pays little to nothing for maintenance and pilot or payment in lieu of taxes. So they are not pulling their share financially, even though they have a large footprint. And the response, the trust has studied prospective academic tendencies and our financial projections assume reasonable revenues from a future academic anchor tenant. The nature of anchor tenants in successful mixed use academic districts are that they are typically able to negotiate a unique financial arrangement in exchange for the activity they generate. It is worth noting that Cornell Tech does pay a contribution towards transportation expenses on Roosevelt Island. And another sub question, what mechanism is in place to prevent the pursuit for academic institutions to be abandoned in favor of someone who will pay more taxes due to the recession? Why wouldn't a for profit company, uh, for instance, Amazon, Google, Bloomberg, Tesla, Trump University, et cetera, open a climate education center instead of traditional academia in order to obtain the housing options. 
And the response, the trust will be issuing a solicitation in 2021 to attract an anchor institution focused on climate research and education. This solicitation will include specifically outlined goals, which are currently being developed in partnership with the trust's community and advisory council and members of the community board. The trust is looking to attract a mission oriented anchor institution and has not outlined goals to attract a corporate campus, but encourages the community board to address this concern through its resolution. The trust is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. All leases on Governor's Island must be approved by the trust's board of directors, which includes representation from community board one and other local local elected officials. No lease or project can move forward without this input. Permanent residential housing is not permitted on Governor's Island. It is not proposed as part of this plan, and it is not on the table as part of the proposed solicitation. Next question, how is the underpinning the of the financing related to funds from the city and state? Why is it a requirement to ensure they pay nothing looking ahead? Response, the trust is currently receiving funds from the city, which funds approximately 75% of its annual operating budget only for a six month public season and 100% of its capital budget. That number is flatlined and is subject to cuts in any given year. As outlined previously, it has always been the vision to expand access and enliven Governor's Island year round with a mix of educational, commercial, and nonprofit facilities, as well as a public park, which has been completed but still requires funds for maintenance and future enhancements. While there is no specific timeline where the trust is cut off from public funds, one of the big advantages of financial self-sufficiency is predictability and sustainability. During times of recession, parks are disproportionately cut, more than double overall cuts to other city services. Governor's Island is also more than a park. In addition to expansive open space, the trust is responsible for stewarding over 50 beautiful historic buildings, sites for expanded uses, and maintaining all infrastructure and transportation. Expanding the use of Governor's Island will help breathe new life into its historic resources and support expanded public access. Next question. After this one, more. Why were no costs, revenues associated or noted about support services like grocery stores, laundries, et cetera. The existing financial projections include approximately 147,000 gross square feet of amenity and services retail, which was studied in the environmental impact statement for the South Island. We anticipate this future amenity retail being a combination of food and beverage establishments, along with the typical district supporting retail establishments Revenue from such uses are included in our financial projections. And finally, last question, can you provide 3D models the trust use for existing conditions, reasonable worst case development scenarios and no action conditions? Images provided previously and published in the urban design chapter of the DEIS show existing conditions, massing, depicting the reasonable worst case development scenarios and no action conditions. Moreover, the trust design consultants produced additional view perspectives as requested by the community board in public meetings between September and November. Our policy is not to share editable files to ensure fidelity to the proposed zoning envelope and EIS, but are happy to answer any specific questions about the images provided. I have reached the end. It's a lot and I appreciate you doing that. Thank you very much. Um, I will go through hands up. It's going to go Andrew 1st, then Laura. On general questions and remember, we have the trust here. To try and answer questions to start and we're going to do questions. Basically, until about 7. And then we'll start going through what we need for. Uh, resolution. Andrew, you're 1st. So I guess my question ties back to, and, and Dan, I don't know if you can move the screen up to, I think maybe the second question, I can't recall. But anyway, we, we were asking the question for them to create some financial modeling based on, I guess what we're considering a minimum or, or bare bones. Why do we think what's been presented is sort of not the the, end state that's necessary for 
for the trust and the island to be self-sufficient. I guess my question is, do we think that they've overshot their financial projections and this plan is grander than it needs to be? Does that make any a lot sense? Of, that's, it's a question you're asking. There's been a lot of public comment about that. And there has been a lot of question as to that has not, you know, it is drastically different than the 2013 that was given. The amount of development is drastically different, which has led to these questions. Does that answer? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Laura Starr, you're next on the questions. So, you know, it's interesting. We're working on a similar project in a different location for the state and they're tearing down a lot of their historic buildings because they can't find a use for them and it's really expensive to try to maintain them and rehab them and i know that the history of governor's island is important but i'm just wondering how much of the financial burden is trying to do adaptive reuse of these buildings that don't that are really hard to adapt and to preserve that's my first well, question. I have a bunch of questions. That I think um, would come directly back from the trust to answer. So, uh, Claire or Sarah? Uh, great, I'll start and then I, I might ask Chris to chime in as well. Um, Hi, Chris, so sorry, I didn't mean to leave you out there. <laughs> no, 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 okay. Chris Tepper is here. He's our Chief Development Officer. Um, thanks for the question, Laura. Um, you know, basically what we did to approach this, and I, I do want to say that this financial model was the result of really hundreds of hours of work uh, and was not taken lightly, um, is we really were setting out the idea of what is the minimum that it would take to get to break even. Um, and so that's why we did include in this question what we think that sort of bare minimum threshold is, which is um, doing the math in my head, 3.75 million square feet as opposed to 4.2 um, Seven five, so basically five hundred, approximately five hundred thousand less would get us to revenues exactly equal expenses. Um, the historic buildings um, and maintenance of all of the infrastructure on the island is a huge part of the uh, expenses that we face, and um, a big part of the overall operating budget. Not that we're solving for is a capital reserve that is used to do things like replace roofs, replace windows. Um, do facade repairs whenever possible. Um, and that is really most relevant for the historic buildings, which require um, very heavy maintenance and-, um, and really How much is that exactly? Claire, could you tell us how much that yeah. is? Chris, do you know exactly, do we know exactly how much that is? I mean, the capital reserve is what percent of the overall number? It's quite a large portion. Yeah, in, in, today's, in today's dollars, the capital reserve is about the same it's about 50 percent of our total need um and so where we have an operating budget today of about 20 million the capital reserve we're also um believe that in today's dollars it should also be about 20 million a year some of that is for the waterfront and maritime infrastructure and and, and much of that would is, is for the upland historic buildings and do you have i mean have you ever been able to figure out how to really occupy all those buildings? Like, are they just kind of like the the bowling ball around the you know, that the person's dragging? So, well, I mean, we we celebrate the historic buildings and and really want to reactivate them all, and think there's a pathway to that. Part of our real estate strategy and and why we think having a large academic anchor is so important is to really create that market demand, and also to have the 24 7 access have it like right now the um you know it's hard to be a first mover if you're a relatively small business and we don't have you know year-round access and year-round visitors and things like that so part of having a large anchor and the development on the south island that supports us having expanded access does two things it both creates a market on the island but also gives us the financial support so that we can have expanded access so that more people can get here all around all, all year round, whether you're uh, someone who would visit a, a business on the island or be a worker who an owner of a business where you're you're concerned with how your workers get to work every day and, and whether they have a place to have lunch. 
Okay, you so know, the, following the up on that, so, so what were the case studies that you studied that you said were relevant to this? Um, well, I think we've looked at a number of um, things like the Presidio in San Francisco at innovation districts um, around the country that have been um, anchored by uh, academic institutions. They didn't all necessarily have um, you know, a historic uh, adaptive reuse component like Governor's Island, but there are precedents um, like the Presidio in San Francisco for um, uh, a combination of both um, kind of new tenancy, new construction, and, and adaptive reuse. Chris can also pull those um, names up, Laura, while we're hanging out, um, just so we can give you a little bit more detail on that. But I do want to underscore that leadership before us and we have spent 10 years trying to get tenants for the North Island buildings. And the thing, the two things we have heard over and over, which Chris just illuminated are, call me when you get an anchor tenant and how can we get 24 seven, 365 access. Um, and so we really believe um, based on our own experience elsewhere and having uh, done quite an ex quite extensive work on this, that those are the two hurdles to getting the North Island buildings up and running. So I don't, I don't doubt that. I guess the, the question I have really is, well, I mean, I know that like with the earlier um, build out volume, you know, it was hard to attract, let's say NYU to Governor's mm -hmm. Island, like some major players, right? So, I mean, how do you, have you had conversations with anybody like that? Like, do you know that this, like, have you tested your hypothesis in any way that we need? My concern is that, like, right now, when I walk over the Brooklyn Bridge, I see this park, this island park in the harbor. And I did that two days ago. You know, with your build out, when I look over the bridge, I'm going to see the financial district blooming on Governor's Island. So you're, you're going to be like, you've got FIDI with its density. You've got Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn with its density. And like Governor's Island is supposed to be this kind of magic green, you know, jewel in the harbor, and it's going to be bracketed by, you know, my office building where I work is 17 is like, you know, it's like 20, it's going to be like, like Broad Street or Maiden Lane or like Lower Manhattan. So, you know, I think the big question we have is prove like even or don't prove, but we it's too much. Like that's what we're saying. It's too much. And we want to work with you. We love Governor's Island. We know that you are doing a great job. You have a great team. You know, we just want to Laura. Laura. Yeah. yeah. Wait for wait for the commentary till we get to resolution because it's part of okay. discussion. Because I Okay, but anyway, okay, yeah. fine. So basically I just want to really understand like what was missing from the 2013 plan that, a, that an operation like NYU, or now I understand Columbia is building a climate center, like, you know, did they really need this, you know, three times as much FAR or like density in order to come here? And how do we know that they will come there and that Amazon won't? That's really the question. Understood. Um, and it sounds like Tammy would like to Hold on that. I would I, the one question I would exactly. ask. Was, we did ex, we did do extensive outreach to universities, and we would not be proceeding with this if we um, did not believe that we will get responses to this solicitation. Okay. So the next hands up that I had. Oh goodness gracious, uh, Andrew, has your question been answered? Are you done? So you can take it down. Okay, great. We're gonna go. Oh. Oh, no, Rosa, you're... But if you could come back to me, I violated the rule of writing down all my questions, so I missed one. Dang it. You'll be, you'll be on the last call. Okay, That's Rosa, fine. then Paul, and then um, I have questions. So, Rosa, you go. Okay, thank you. Um, you're I welcome. I have four questions. Um, so, regarding the residential FAR, I'm... I understand that you want to have dormitory use, but dormitory use goes under community facility. So why do you need the resi FAR specifically 715,000 zoning square feet of it? Um, so that's question one. 
Um, thanks, Rosa. Um, the reason you're absolutely right about dorm faculty housing does go under resi FAR, as does caretaker housing, um, and as do such uses as artist residency space. Um, and so that's how we downsized, uh, or uh, we're you know basically are proposing the 700 to account for those uses and those uses only. Okay, that that seems extremely high, but um, but I'll accept that. Okay, um, if the Statue of Liberty is 205 feet tall, and I remember at a prior um, presentation you had said you were using that as your height limit um, marker, then how are we ending up with um, buildings that are going to be 360 feet tall? Or if you look at the new coastal resiliency text, could theoretically be higher than that even. Um, th thanks for that as well, Rosa. The Statue of Liberty is 305, um, mm -hmm. and we um, appreciate that height is going to be a subject of tonight's resolution. Um, you know, so I hear what you're saying, and um, in particular, the zoning coastal resiliency issue. We have um, had a call with DCP and um, your consultant, George, um, and are, you know, prepared to whatever, set whatever we need to so that there isn't room to quote unquote, Jimmy rig that it's not really not meant to be a loophole. It's just the conflation of these 2 things happening at the same time. Okay, so, but even without the coastal resiliency modification, um, you would still end up with bulkheads or mechanical spaces mm -hmm. that would reach uh, at least Rose, Rosa. Yep. Rosa, the, that's going to be part of what we put in the resolution because okay. I've not heard anybody who said to me, wow, we want 400 foot towers. That's just great. So that's part of what we're going to, we're going to put down there. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, then the East Esplanade, um, because it has so many and, and because the major ferry landing point is going to be there as well on the East Esplanade, um, are you not willing to make it bigger, wider? No, we're happy to work with you all on that. Um, just speaking totally frankly, we heard um, some folks on during these calls and in public comment call for it to be enlarged and some folks who thought it really shouldn't be much bigger because it would become more like a thoroughfare. Um, so it's a concern we absolutely want to address. We just want to make sure we get to the right answer so that it really can be a public amenity. So it's not about not being prepared to widen it. We just want to make sure we're hearing um, collectively from the CB about what their recommendation on that is. Okay, and then last question is, um, sorry, uh, public bathrooms, is there any way to have a requirement that even though it's private development that each of these lots are able to incorporate public ac accessible bathrooms since they are all along the perimeter of public park space? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think bathrooms is something also that makes sense to, um, you know, if folks feel that that's an important issue to address in the resolution, because it could be too that it's um, something we're ensuring gets provided either in the development zones or through our own um, to be created facilities. Um, but, of, you know, I it's funny when I started here, some of the first complaints I got were around shade and water fountains and restrooms. And so things like that, that are about amenitizing the park are absolutely mission critical. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you, Rosa. Moving on to Paul Goldstein. Remember, we're just asking questions unanswered. All the points that you have will, will go into a resolution. So keep got going. It. Got it, okay. I really just have one fundamental question, which is um, you already mentioned that uh, your financial analysis indicates that this is the amount of money that you need to accomplish what you're trying to do on the island. So the question I have is, does that include making the island year round and therefore also having year-round programming of all the facilities? Thank, thanks, Paul. Yes, the um, both the financial analysis and the including the modeling on expenses and then um, reciprocal revenues that could come from things like concessions um, contemplate opening the island year-round. That is baked in as you know, sort of honestly, priority one um, around being able to expand the amenity. So, yes, year round 
access and year round programming. Um, you know, it would be easy for all of us to dream up amazing things we could do on the island in the months it's closed. But, you know, whether that's sledding or ice skating rinks or just a place to take a walk and get a hot chocolate or whatever it is that you like to drink, um, all, all of that is part of the, the analysis and the work. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Moving back uh, to, sorry, Andrew, you're gonna have to wait first timers first. Richard Corman. Uh, yes, hi, Claire. Uh, I have a question about the anticipated uh, infrastructure investment that may be required. I mean, the substantial infrastructure investment will be required. And my question is, how much is that to be, uh, how much have you expected that to be? And when would that need to take place? And what's the relationship between that investment, the source of those funds, and the securing of the anchor tenant and other uh, tenants that would pay? Claire? I'm sorry, um, Richard, thank you. Those are great questions. Um, I'll start and I may ask Chris to jump in. So we currently have a 10 year capital plan with the city of New York. Um, the total of that 10 year capital plan is approximately $110 million. That includes funding to um, uh, rebuild some essential water lines, um, expand the sewer system, uh, do all of the electrification on the island, uh, as well as su supply some new ferries. Um, in addition to that, we've identified the need in the longer term for a second water line under the buttermilk channel um, and additional feeder cables through the Battery Maritime Tunnel, all of which have been planned for for this uh, facility for, for many, many years. Um, so the way the capital plan is laid out, the timing will work with the uh, expansion of this development. It's obviously the development obviously isn't going to happen overnight. It's going to happen over many years. Um, and then in addition, expansion of services such as security, EMT, increased operations of the ferry. So the frequency is all um, uh, more often and the year round question that Paul asked are built into the OPEX portion of the financial model as well. Um, Chris, did I miss, any, miss anything critical in there? No, just... uh, really the, the planning over the last 10 years has been phased so that, um, you know, we still have a few more items to complete, but that are all in process as, as Claire mentioned in, in our in our capital plan today. So let me just uh, follow up a little bit for clarity. Um, how much of that capital plan is required for this new development? Mm -hmm. How much of it would be paid for by the tenants versus the taxpayer? Yeah, that's a good question. So the way we have approached the um, capital work is to basically size the infrastructure to allow for the you know full development, um, but then that each future developer or future school would be responsible. Um, as they might be if they were on a city street, possibly a bit higher than that for um, doing all of the tie-ins, doing anything in this street adjacent to their site, and obviously all of the actual building construction, or in the case of a North Island building, the full adaptive reuse and gut renovation of that asset. Richard, you good? I think so, I think so. Okay. Paul, I'll ask you to put your hand down, and Richard, if you're done, Colin, and then myself, and then Andrew. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, just three quick questions, if you don't mind. I'll ask them all first. Um, one, do you have any update on what the Climate Center actually is, what it will do, who it will cater to, and how it will serve the public good? The second question is, how will you offset the carbon expenditure? Uh, sorry, the carbon expenditure uh, that you'll actually put into the atmosphere for creating a construction this size, project this size, and three, how will it be powered? Thanks. Great, thanks, Colin. I'm sorry, I was writing them down, so I didn't track. 
Um, so the Climate Center, as we've been talking about, we're doing continuing to advance the strategic planning as we speak. We continue to do interviews and research. Um, we have a few committees that consist uh, of members of the CAC and the community board that are formed to talk through some of those goals. Um, we would welcome anyone on this call's participation, Colin, yours in particular, because I know this is an area of expertise of yours. But in particular, what we are focused on at the moment is um, the bringing together of the hard sciences with the social sciences, which we've heard that in particular there's a need for, um, and putting all of that in a public space where we can really curate public engagement experiences around the issue of climate and help to build that out in a community of nonprofits, including environmental justice organizations. What we're doing right now is really um, thinking about what is the sweet spot for a potential university user or research user vis-a-vis uh, -vis how they could enhance their programming with a location in New York. And so the potential in particular around um, focusing on issues of adaptation and how we um, create uh, built environments that are much more sustainable and how we adaptively reuse old or adapt old buildings to be more energy efficient, recognizing that a lot of the scientific solutions are in place for that. That's where the importance of bridging it with the policy comes into place. But that work is absolutely ongoing. And so part of it is going to occur in the writing of the RFP and then in the evaluation of the responses. Um, we, when writing things like this, need to be careful to walk the line between expressing the goals of the city and also giving flexibility to climate experts and uni climate university or users at universities who are really going to tell us how they can see this adding value. Um, on the offset of carbon expenditure, that too, I would say, you know, we're in the process of writing the sustainability, resiliency, and design guidelines for the future construction on the island. Um, you know, I've heard folks in this forum talk about wanting us to commit to net zero, uh, wanting us to, Colin, exactly what you're saying, commit to carbon offsets to make sure that the uh, impact of the construction is not essentially um, you know, deleterious to the overall goal of the project. And so again, these are things that we would certainly encourage coming out in the resolution so that um, it's something we wanna work on, it's something we are working on, and we understand that it's hugely important. And, and the final one, and I'll leave you with this, is uh, ultimately will be powered, but it, my final comment on this stage anyways, is it's awfully difficult for me, and I know a lot of people, other people on this call to vote on something with such unfinished plans. You know, you've mentioned a great deal about this climate center, but we don't even know what it does. And I, I'm I'm a little fearful that it's, you know, fluff. If I can be completely frank, so yeah. I just I can't vote on something unless I actually see what these plans, how these plans are going to formulate themselves. And how do you how do you plan on it being powered? Uh, we talked about before about current technologies not being suitable to power an island that size. It just it just isn't going to happen. Sure, if you're putting a wind farm offshore, how mm -hmm. do you plan on powering it? Is it going to be on the city's grid? Um, it is currently on the city's grid, um, and I think, uh, you know, certainly staying on the grid has a lot of, I mean, it's going to be necessary also just for redundancy, but how we supplement that on the island, either through geothermal or even potentially something in the water or through supporting sustainable energy um, in other ways is all also very much on the table. We believe it's possible to get to net zero. Um, is that going to happen overnight? No, of course not. Um, and, and you know that as well. Um, but the important thing for us is making sure that we're preparing the power infrastructure in a way that we can continue to march toward that goal. And by employing really aggressive sustainability goals for the new development and adaptive reuse, we can also help to sort of close that gap, um, both by reducing demand and bringing up sustainable sources. Thank you. Okay, so Richard and Andrew have already gone. I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then we'll circle back to you. And then I know Diana had some specific zoning questions as well. Um, on the financial modeling that we talked about, the master plan had originally said that tax exempt organizations would have to pay pilot, um, which for those who are not familiar with that, that's payment in lieu of taxes. Welcome to Battery Park City. The model appears from what you've sent us that there will be no pilot revenues. So I'm curious because the city is, you know, obviously the state has used it here for both Roosevelt Island, 
uh, Battery Park City, and that's part of what, you know, there is, uh, there was a conversation of, about pilot when Cornell came to Roosevelt Island and the pros and cons of the way things were handled there, I won't get into. But the city also used to make NYCHA pay a pilot, you know, for police and fire and services. So why is Governor's Island choosing to forego pilot? Um, I think, um, so we're, in the sense of the value, we're not. So the thing about um, users who help to pay for police and fire and all that, that we're accounting for via a CAM, um, a common area maintenance charge, and that is in the model. Um, in addition, even nonprofit users, even on Roosevelt Island, don't pay a pilot. So the, the Roosevelt Island pilot is um, only applicable to the hotel use in the office building, for example, which is built into our model. Um, it's just labeled property tax. Um, so, you know, the, when we approach this, when we look at all these comps and what we essentially say is on a per square foot basis, how much can this use type afford to pay? whether you're calling it rent or CAM or pilot or property tax. Um, and so we absolutely, we have definitely not foregone those revenues. Okay. Um, and then I've got a couple other questions about your, the p &Ls for capital reserve. Um, is there, why didn't, or is, why haven't you? Or will you, they're both questions, take a look at floating debt and then just service the debt instead of a capital reserve? Um, Chris, do you want to take, take a stab at that one? If not, I can. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's definitely something we could explore, but th that also adds, I mean, you still have um, maintenance, you still have uh, bond servicing costs um, every year as well. So it, it's it can explore, but when you borrow money, as everyone knows, it's not as if it's free. You're going to have to still pay back interest, uh, principal, and have balloon payments for the principal. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know that that uh, materially changes the amount of money that's still needed every year for the capital maintenance and what you're spending the money on. Um, and, and repairs. It's just a question of like where that money's coming from and whether we're saving it ourselves or borrowing it and paying somebody back may actually increase uh, overall cost in the long term because there would be, um, you know, interest payments to the bank and lenders. But this, the reason why I ask specifically is that the city has a program set up to help 501c3s specifically like the trust to float tax exempt debt to finance real estate, which would significantly change the balance sheet, you know, and especially as, you know, right now, the kind of rates that you could get, it could lower the total amount of density and other things that are needed if you were able to go down, you know, those kinds of financial reports. So, you know, we're looking at, you know, if, if the answer is we haven't seen fiscal modeling based on the 2013, which mm -hmm. is what the community was sold, right, for the master plan. And whether or not it, whether or not it was fully fleshed out or a placeholder or anything that's been said to us, the, the community was told, this is a presentation, this is what we're looking at, hence here's our master plan and, and our zones, right? So that's what the community absorbed. Now we're being told to get to sustainability. And it, again, there's question of whether or not that's actually required or needed, um, that the only way to do it is by three times development. So we're looking and I'm questioning now the financials because now we haven't seen like why the 2013 necessarily isn't gonna go. Um, and instead of you know building a capital reserve fund, how could we help you be more fiscally sustainable through other modeling? And what and where could that have been in a complete you know in the story to help you get to where you go? And there's they're saying that you know the margins could have been even better with that. You could have gotten with less development, more fiscally sustainable. Um, 
so tip, typically when um, people uh, raise money on in the form you're talking about, it's because they have a big upfront capital investment to make. And then as Chris was alluding to the ongoing payments, therefore are quite a bit higher. So it's obviously we're in a hard position um, to go back in time and opine on what could have been in 2013. But at this point where we are, the use of that, first of all, I don't think we could use that form of debt because we don't have long term ground leases um, signed against which we could collateralize. But um, even if we could, it would actually be more expensive and more detrimental to the um, financial model because of the interest payments that Chris was saying. If we if we needed to raise a hundred million dollars today, um, mm -hmm. then that would be a great way to approach it. A hundred percent agree. Um, and then the other thing, Tammy, is um, I you know I do I, I again we can't opine on what was um, promised to the community board in 2013, but um, we did go back and look at the 2013 EIS again um, and. You know, it 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 does say that there's no financial model, no real program, um, and so, you know, for us in terms of answering that question, we've already modeled the minimum square footage required to exactly break even, and that's the 3.75. So, every every square foot below that just broadens the gap. Um, so it's not not wanting to be responsive to that. It's just um, having looked back at 2013. Um, ourselves, um, we we can't. There, you know, there's, yeah. It, um, as I said, it, it, there's no program I'd associated with that that we can find. Yeah, and I'll just add that um, the previous presentations, both for the park um, construction, design and construction, and the North Island Historic District, um, looking back at all of the past community board presentations. Um, it was always noted that the South Island development sites would be um, uh, proposed in future uh, phases um, and and that they would require a rezoning to be in compliance with the deed. So that is that is obviously a clear part of what we're presenting now. But um, I did want to note that um, at least I could not find anything in previous presentations that noted that the um, South Island development assumptions as studied from the EIS was actually presented as a proposal or, or plan to the board. <laughs> All right. I mean, just one more thing on the modeling question, because I uh, like the 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 structure that we're using in terms of and proposing in terms of having revenues both obviously pay for our direct operating expenses, but also fund a conservative and a fiscally responsible capital reserve is the same structure that um, you know other parks and public spaces use like Brooklyn Bridge Park and Hudson River Park and, and, and Battery Park City. Um, you know, they're not issuing or borrowing money each time they need to make a relatively small capital repair. Um, they're self-funding those through a reserve because that, that actually is the cheapest way to do it because you're not paying interest. With all due respect, the Battery Park City Authority just raised half a mi millions and millions of dollars for resiliency. So. Uh, let's 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 not go down that road on there. But the 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 reason why it keeps coming back to the 2013, both for Sarah, Claire, and you, is that the 2013 model is is presented today as an alternative in all the other um, in the EIS in the DEAS and things like that. So if it's being used as an alternative to show comparison, then the community should see what that comparison in full completion is. It's not fair to use it as a comparison and then say, oh, but it's not a real comparison. And you've used it as a benchmark modeling. So that's that's where I'm going on that. And that's why we keep coming back to it is because it's still used today as an alternative. And so we want to see what that alternative is, because it goes it does fall in line with the public comments that have been made and resolutions that stand on fact. And it was never presented to the community board as an option, but it's listed as one. So I don't mean to, to sound adversarial, but the re you can't find the information. That's even more disturbing to me because I couldn't find it and it's being used as an alternative. So, um, yeah, I think what maybe Wesley can jump in there, but, uh, you know, of course, did we take the EIS process very seriously as well? And um, I think the way the alternatives were presented and analyzed is um, 
I don't want to use the word standard, but, um, you know, I'm hearing why you guys keep going back to this. I understand what you're saying. Um, okay. All right, let me wind up uh, Andrew and then Richard. If you still have questions that are outstanding, Andrew, you go first and then Richard, and then we will move forward because it's 716. Thanks, Tammy. And sorry, you're having to double back on me, but there's a lot of a lot of numbers being floated around in terms of acreage and percentages. Can I ask the trust just to to try and simplify our understanding that the footprint of Governor's Island is 172 acres? What is the 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 proposed rezoning encompasses what percentage or what amount of acreage of the 172 acres? Um, sure, thanks, Andrew. Um, the proposed rezoning encompasses a, just over approximately 50% of the island. Um, and of that, um, only the 33 acres have development on them. So can I successfully divide 33 by 172 <laughs> in my head? Maybe 17%. 17% of the island is in the development zones. Everyone can fact check me. That's right. I mean, between the north, um, I will just point out that between the North Island um, open space and the, the South Island open space, um, about 120 acres are, are open space. Um, and then the, as Claire mentioned, the development zones themselves are um, 33 acres in total. Got it. Thank you. Richard. Mr. Corman. One might, after a year or almost a year, learn how to unmute oneself in all of these <laughs> processes. Nah. Um, nah. A little bit, this is a little bit of a follow up or um, carry on of your comments and questions, Tammy, but it goes back to the core assumption here about the um, the trust in the island needing to be uh, self sustainable. And to me, that's really a question. That's a taxpayer. That's a city constituency, and maybe even a state constituency. But it's at least a city constituency question. And I don't believe we've had uh, the information around which taxpayers, voters have an opportunity to make an assessment as to whether that's really a legitimate and necessary goal. And I say that because I know you've dealt with and you've talked about intense and detailed financial modeling. And maybe the community board has seen it and I just haven't, but I've not seen any of the financials and I'm not sure. And I've looked back at different resolutions. I've never seen a single financial analysis, but certainly I haven't seen one that says to me, how much would a taxpayer, how much would the city have to pay? How much would we as taxpayers have to pay to maintain the island as is, case one or in the initial 2013 development plan case two and leave that to be our choice before we decide that we would give up all of this development all of this precious public land i think we need to see that information though that that analysis financial analysis tell me what the city would have to in, uh, pony up in order for us to keep this island in its wonderful natural state and allow us to use it six months and allow us to use it year round. So we have those choices. We don't have the choices. You haven't really given us those choices in a way that we can make, I feel that I can make an intelligent decision. So are those numbers, I'll make this into a question, are those numbers available? And if they are, can we see them? So Claire, he's he's and Chris, he's specifically talking about something that would enable the modeling to understand based on you know x number of development, 
this is where sustainability would get you over X number of years, uh, whether or not, you know, whether the island could be open six months or 24 months a year, what, what's the difference in that? Things like that. Sure. Um, and, you know, thank, Tammy. Thank you for helping, Tammy. You're welcome. Thanks, thanks, Tammy. Thanks, Richard. Um, and I, Tammy, I'll leave this to you. If it would be helpful, we'd be happy to go through the financial model slides this evening. We do have them available. Um, you know, the, from from our perspective as the Trust for Governors Island, the reason this project is so mission critical for us is, um, in some respects, exactly for the reasons you're describing, which is that it costs a large sum of money every year to maintain the island even in the shape it's in today without addressing bringing the historic buildings back to life and without getting it to a 365 use. What what we deal with in, um, and I think what a lot of parks face with respect to city funding is um, pretty constant uncertainty, constant budget cuts, um, and the inability to really provide a sort of stable robust resource um so i do think that answers to your questions are in the financial model and we'd be happy to go through them it's hard for me to rattle them off off the tip of my tongue um but really you know for us having this revenue stream that is for the trust for governor's island and that must stay on governor's island is going to enable us to expand to year round to maintain the asset to bring the North Island buildings back to life, to expand programming, um, which we've heard extensively for folks, to do things like provide better and more access to the water, um, to do things like provide better and more access to field space. Um, and we just don't have that today. So I think, you know, Sarah, you can see the hardest conversations we're having have to do with, if we understood, for example, what the 2013 plan came, with a third less density, and we could put it up next to this, what you would lose, what you would gain, it would be able to enable the community to have a far more robust dialogue on this. Because what we've been given is, this is it, folks. We figured out how to do this, um, but it doesn't necessarily solve the questions that remain. Um, I've been notified there are a couple of people in the public wondering if they can speak, and I'm gonna explain this again as I did before. We have already had several public meetings as well as a public hearing. So for tonight's purpose, um, if you had testimony, there is a, um, a publicly posted Governor's Island comment link you could have commented. If you are desperate to comment, I will say um, I can stick that link in the chat and you can put your comment there. This is not the only part of the process. This is the community board advisory role on the process. There are other places that you will be able to opine because the borough president after we're done will um, weigh in on this and then it will also go to CPC. So there will be places for a public hearing and you can certainly make your opinions known in other places even before it gets to city council. Okay. So um, I think that that takes the opportunities that we have. Do I have any other questions from the board? Fern, you got anything? All right, let's go okay. back to. Nope, sorry, I was on mute. Do we, no worries. Do we have any other questions from any other board members before we head into the, main, the sort of meatier parts of this evening, I would say? Okay. Um, uh, Sarah, Claire, if you have, or Chris, if you have the financials, um, I would love for you to send a link. I do not believe they are posted anywhere on the website, on the Governor's Island website, um, for what we're talking about in terms of rezoning and things like that. And before uh, we move on, I do want to introduce George um, because his name has come up and I want to make sure that everybody knows who he is. Um, we are a very dynamic board. We have an incredible fortunate uh, resource with Diana Sweetai, who is our um, land use consultant and an urban planner. But because of the complexities of what we have in Community Board One with so many things in front of us, um, we did a somewhat uh, strategic decision and hired George James to 
help us and work with the community board to review everything. You know, having uh, 50 board members who are volunteers is one thing. Diana <laughs> cannot do everything to everyone. There's only 24 hours in a day. So I want to introduce George. I think you're here somewhere. You yes. can unmute. Yep. Thank you, Tammy. Yeah, I'm here. Happy to answer questions. Um, that, that Perfect. Work. So I have George and we have Diana, who's been um, amazing in helping through all of this. And does anybody have any other things before we start jumping in? I'm trying to see, Diana, where we need to go. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking at my notes myself to make sure I've got everything. Whew. All right, I think we should take it from here. We've gotten through all of our Q&A, we've gotten through everything else. Let's start going through the points that we will need for a resolution. Now, um, there Tammy, you go. Um, I know that Allison Brown from DCP is on and, and maybe wanted to clarify one procedural comment that was made earlier. Allison, are you are you available? If if I, I am. Hi. Hi everybody. This is Allison. Hi Allison, welcome. Um, thank you. I just wanted to quickly go over because I know the language has changed a little bit on that form um, from maybe past resolutions the board has seen. So um, I think Diana did a, a great job of explaining, um, you know, approve and disapprove, it's favorable or unfavorable. And then um, as always, the conditionality uh, is an opportunity for the board to kind of color their response and, and give context of um, why the board is voting in a certain way. Uh, and then Laura touched upon this earlier, I think, but just to underline um, what is what is really being voted on the proposed text amendment without the text amendment. Um, you know, development is still possible on the island. It would just be the underlying uh, R32 zoning that exists today. Um, and of course, the, the constraints on the island. Uh, it's was, was there, but I just wanted to to reiterate that. Um, are there any other questions on this? The deadline is and always has been um, December twenty eighth. Um, the sixty day start of the clock actually starts nine days after uh, the referral because of you know days of yore when we had to mail things physically. We gave ourselves an extra nine day buffer. So, um, December 28th is the official deadline. Which is good because we voted full board at the 22nd and by the time we get the paperwork done, it'll be in by the 28th. So we're good. Perfect. Right. But if Allison, I completely appreciate we have spent so much time with you in community board one, um, in the last month, if you don't mind hanging in with us, um, we really appreciate you being on board here. That's great. Of course, um, Tammy, it's Alice. Um, can I just, Allison, hi and hi everybody. Can you just confirm, um, you bring up this point, what the square footage allotment would be in the case of not going forward? Um, how much square footage is allowed on the island currently in terms of development and what the FAR is? I, I actually don't know that. Um, I, I would actually uh, ask the trust to confirm my head. Um, it's whatever is uh, allowed as of right in an R3 to. Wesley, do you want to um, respond to that, even if it's not the exact square footage? Otherwise, we'll pull it up. Wesley? Sorry, I'm on the mute. mute. For community facility uses, you're permitted up to one FAR. And then for the uh, non-permanent residential uses that are permitted out there, the residential FAR is 0. 0.5. And the proposed is, could you? Well, actually that's, Wesley, that's not the best way to do it. We have to do it in square footage. 
So the total the total size of the South Island is 90 acres. Correct. I hate to put everyone on the point on the spot for math. You could certainly respond to this later, but obviously in understanding what you know what would happen if if we if this board did not vote that way, what what are we talking about in terms of the alternative? That's all. We have, the, we have the exact numbers and we'll pull them up for you now, Alice. Um, one of the things, the point that I think Claire is trying to make, though, that it's important is is the existing zoning, the R32, covers the entire central open space area. Right. And so that is still today generating FAR. Um, and and frankly, it is um, under the existing zoning rules that exist today. It's, uh, it's, it's permitted to build in that area. So one of the, I think, key public benefits of the zoning proposal here is that it's rationalizing development into the two development areas and, and protecting, um, downsizing the amount of uh, over half, reducing the amount of residential FAR by over half and putting protections on the park permanently. Um, but we, we, we'll, we'll pull up the exact um, uh, permitted um, square footages today. Right, maybe the, yeah, you and, and George James and Diana can help the community better understand all this. And, and, and also in reference to Rosie Chang's earliest earlier comment on the you know the on the residential i wasn't sure i fully understood the quantities there but anyway moving on sorry thank you to, um i didn't want to make con confusion my, my comment was really meant to say we're not we're not the the front of the commission is not development or no development it's the existing thing or this new proposed zoning um so i just wanted to to make it sure that it was clear Correct, but the zoning has to do with development. So, and if we don't comment on that here, I don't, you know, it's, we really don't have many options on where, you know what I mean? I think it's, um, Chris, have you found the number yet? I'm pretty sure it's about 3 million. Uh, that's right, but I am still looking for my summary. Have no fear. You can always get back to us. It's not like we're going anywhere for the, a little bit. So let's kind of, Diana, if you don't mind going back up to the document that we were going to start to work on. The goal is to get, um, and if you could do full screen on yours, because the text is a little small. Okay. So these are, if you haven't had a chance to take a look through the public um, testimony, we have quite a lot of it, which is good. Um, and we have recorded many of the feedbacks that we've received from the variety of meetings that Governor's Island had been uh, with us over the last couple months. So we divided it up, the notes, and this is really for community board members to have to go in, recognizing that we're going to have to get to a vote at the end of this. Okay, so here are comments that have been received um, and, and commented by the board. So, Diana, do you want me to read this or do you want to read it or Fern? One of the three of us should go through. I have no problem doing that if you want me to, Tammy. Go for it. Okay. Um, to begin, I, I think this puts uh, a lot of what we're going to be discussing in context. This first um, paragraph here. This this narrative, I think, is true throughout, and for for all of these categories that we discuss, which is New York City doesn't have a master plan. The New York City zoning resolution serves to function as New York City's master plan, and it is relied upon to make development predictable. While the trust proposal provides maximum accessibility for development through the zoning, these wide parameters are problematic and provide numerous opportunities for exploitative development, especially considering that both use and bulk regulations can uh, be altered through city planning commission authorizations, which do not come before the community board for review and recommendation. Um, so that's, I think that's one of the big points here. And like I said, it's related to many of these categories. Um, where we count, we count on uh, zoning to make development predictable. Um, it's it's left flexible, so flexible in a way that feels unpredictable in many of these categories, and in for many of which we would like to see further refinement. Okay. 
keep on going. We're going to discuss all of open space first. And then we'll get our points together. Great. So for open space generally, this has come up a lot as a point of concern for people. Um, I think many people think of or it's referred to often synonymously between open space and public parkland. Um, but there are very big distinctions in how they're defined in the zoning. Um, in this case, it's the open space sub area. Um, the open space sub area described in the zoning isn't isn't a park in the way that people think of public parkland. Uh, public parkland is defined as such in the zoning, and it has specific um, um, protections and definitions as such. Zoning doesn't apply to public parks under the jurisdiction of the. Parks Department is defined as public parkland, but zoning does apply to the open space sub area on Governor's Island. And while the open space sub area doesn't generate any floor area, the zoning still allows structures not typically found in parks. They're considered as permitted obstructions and exempt from any floor area or coverage restrictions. Buildings and other structures up to 35 feet are allowed without limitation when they house permitted uses. Um, it's a wide range of permitted uses. The buildings or structures could include uh, such but not limited to large restaurants and bars with entertainment and dancing, transit facilities, physical called establishments and gyms, commercial beaches or pools and recreational facilities, including temporary circuses, golf driving ranges, and outdoor uh, skating and skateboard rinks. The proposed zoning also allows all uses in use group 15. Uh, it's the most restricted use group in the New York City zoning resolution, and it's currently only allowed as of right C7 districts because it's been defined as appropriate only in a few areas designated for open amusement parks. So, in consideration of all of that, um, in this document here, we've captured a few points in response, which is that residents of CB1 and throughout New York City count on Governor's Island as a critical park and recreational resource. The proposed zoning fails to provide sufficient protection of the open space sub area, which is vastly different from actual parkland. And the open space sub area should be established and classified as public parkland. The deed specifies open space as public park, which implies much greater protection over the currently proposed open space. If not defined as public parkland in the zoning, use, uses should be eliminated from the open space sub area so that no development would be allowed in the open space sub area. And that would make it consistent with the environmental review, which showed no development in the open space sub area. And I know that George James consultant did um, some math on the maximum amount of development that would be allowed in that category of permitted obstructions under 35 feet. Um, and, it, and I believe it was it was 6,800,000 gross square feet of development. Um, which I assume is not the intention here, but when we talk about those areas that are that are flexible in a way that the community board is concerned is exploitative, this is one of those areas. Okay. So where we're going here is that we need to put bullet points in for a resolution. If you, this is where the committee discusses the community board goes in and we're going to go kind of section by section as it relates to the zoning. So a little up further, if you don't mind, Diana, on the doc. Do you want me to read on for everything in open space? Yeah, we're going to do it section by section. I think that's the, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's much to go. We could just go, do the whole section. Great. For fields and active recreation, that's a point that came up a lot through our meetings. It's a point that we heard a lot through uh, our written public comment of which we received, I think, right around 150, which is way up there in terms of written comment we've received on, on any zoning application in the history of Community Board 1. But this was definitely one of the big consistent points is that fields and active recreation spaces should be prioritized and preserved and that fields and active recreation spaces should be preserved for community use with continued programming priorities for child and youth recreational leagues. And then specifically for the peers and the peer head, a peer head line isn't defined within the zoning text, uh, and it should be established to control the endpoints of the peers and, and other technical classifications. Limits on public access. 
There are many instances in the zoning requiring public access, but it is limited to when to when the southern subdistrict or the open space sub area is open to the public, including the streets of the southern subdistrict. This language should be amended so that the streets and connections are not closed to the public outside of hours of operation. Reasonable hours of operation should be written into the zoning or hours of operation could reference New York City park hours. And the idea here is that there are no formal uh, streets as defined by the zoning in this proposal, but uh, since streets are not closed or they don't have hours of operation elsewhere in New York City, then that shouldn't be the case here. Okay. Any comments, inclusions, questions of things that we are missing or additions? I'm going to start with Patrick Cannell and then go to Rosa Chang. Patrick, you're up. Patrick, I see you unmuted, but don't hear you. Um, Tammy, we did find the number if we want to kill 30 seconds while we're waiting for Patrick. Um, so the current zoning in place on the South La Island for community facility use would allow up to 3.4 million square feet and for residential use, obviously in line with the deed, 1.7 million square feet. And that's only if no zoning was done. Yep, Patrick, I can hear you now. Okay, Patrick. Uh, yeah, I, I, if it's all right, Tammy, not just specific to this point, I wanted to just kind of go through my viewpoint, which just to uh, begin by explaining the conflict that I have, and, and then I will shut up pretty much for the rest of the meeting. Um, and I, I just want to make sure at, at the outset of this meeting under our community board's bylaws and the conflict of interest rules that I disclose here on um, the record what most of you, I think, know anyways, and that is that I'm a member of the board of directors of the Trust for Governor's Island, it's nominated by uh, the assembly member for the 65th assembly district um, and ultimately appointed by the mayor and it's because of that position on the trust board that i'll recuse myself from voting on um, this application both tonight and at next week's um, full board and it's obviously also the reason i haven't shared our land use committee over the last three months or so uh, but it's also one of the main reasons i've been relatively quiet on this issue for the last couple of months to make sure that all of these concerns from all corners of the city are um, heard and that, as you can see here on the screen, that they're they're collated here at the community board. And so, while I can't vote on the application, I am allowed uh, to and do want to sort of offer my viewpoint for my fellow committee members and board members to consider. Um, and I, I I I would just come back to the. I think it looks like we're headed down some road of conditions, which I think is, is probably right. Um, but I I think that um, I just want to make sure that I a little bit about the overall position too. Um, I think everybody knows that I guard very jealously this committee's you know, credibility when it comes to our process and how we consider all applications, especially um, applications like this with a big citywide importance. Um, and you know, also as an appointed member of the board of the Trust for Governor's Island, um, I, I think I take very seriously the commitment to do what's best um, for our community. And I, we talked a little bit earlier about um, the four choices that we have, yes, no, yes with conditions, no with conditions, um, and how we weigh these kinds of applications. And I guess the first way that I look at it is, if you're not gonna do a yes or a no, you're doing a yes with conditions or a no with conditions. And to me, it comes down to whether an applicant has demonstrated a need. Um, and I, I think when you look at this plan, there is a demonstrated need. Um, and the notion of, some kind of new development on the South Island as a means to making the island self-sufficient. That's always been a part of the plan for the future of the island. It's been a part of the plan since it was first turned over in 2003, um, since the master planning started, certainly that the community board was um, a, a big part of with our planning team. And uh, I remember Michael Levine being part of those processes. Um, so I think what this application is doing is really taking the next logical step in carrying out that master plan, which again is something that um, this community board has long supported. And as Tammy, or actually as Diana just uh, mentioned, I think it's important to point out that the two development zones, they're not parkland. Um, they're, they're, they're really not even that 
publicly accessible at this point. There are areas that have been off limits for almost two decades behind chain, chain link fences. And I just I think that there is a much better use for that space. Um, and while sure, it'd be great that the entirety of those zones would become some, some kind of park space, that's just, it, it's not realistic. It's not what the master plan called for all along. It's not what this community board has supported um, over the years. And it doesn't solve the big part of the puzzle, which is Governor's Island, Governor I, Governor's Island's financial need. Um, and to Tammy's and Richard's questions earlier on that, the information is there. And I, I, I would encourage committee members to look at it closely because it's it's simple in my view. It's, it, there's an overwhelming part of the trust budget um, that comes from government subsidies from allocated from the New York City budget. And as a taxpayer, you know, I for one wouldn't mind watching Governor's Island move out of its parents' basement and get its own source of income. Um, so in other words, I accept that some amount of redevelopment is is needed and that they that the applicant has established a need. So I think it really does come down to these conditions, um, which are really well founded. Um, concerns about ensuring that the use doesn't become something unintended, concerns about bulk and height and protecting the existing open spaces, et cetera. Um, those are all very worthy points. Um, and I think to commend Diana and Fern and Tammy would be um, sort of an understatement for all the work that they have done and Alice too, all the work that they've done in, in coming up with um, this document that I think will help guide that discussion and those conditions. Uh, but I just wanted to make my point known at the outset and that I hope um, others on the committee will support this application, albeit with conditions um, that I recognize that. And so to be clear, I'm asking that everybody vote yes with conditions. So thanks. With, with that, Patrick, I think I actually need to go to Alice next because when you uh, so graciously, thank you, um, explained where you're at and things like that, um, I think everybody on the board may know that Community Board 1 also appoints somebody to the Governor's Island Board, the Trust for Governor's Island Board, and this year we nominated Alice. And Alice, are you there? I am. Uh, I'm, I have to confess, I'm. I'm. I'm not prepared to launch in to some sort of debate here. I think we can't lose sight. First of all, thank you and hello. I put the camera on for better or worse. Um, first of all, uh, I was told by the. Um, I am nominated, uh, and I have not yet been appointed to the trust right. board. And I appreciate the nomination. I'm, you know, and I. Been assured there's there's an appointment to follow and um, I'm but um, anyway that's where I'm at in the process um, but I was told by the um, conflict of interest board today that I also have oh. to recuse myself from the vote um, and that was based because and I thought this was a very interesting interpretation of Koi that in fact um, I would be having um, uh, an influence on the financial interest of the trust. Um, in my vote here tonight. In other words, whatever way that we may vote, we somehow impact the financial interests of the trust. So I want to be clear on why I have to recuse and recuse I will do. And like Patrick, of course, our voices can be heard on this application and any other that comes before Governor's Island. My understanding, which I've shared, of course, with Claire and with the attorney there at um, at the trust and and all, is you know it's a it's a it's an interesting position to hold to try to represent the community's interest as best as I can on both our board and of course on the trust, which is of course a not for profit that is um, dutifully trying to represent the community's interest and benefits and I, you know, identifying benefits for us all. So it's a kind of, you could interpret it, interpret it as a win-win. Um, you know, on that, that, on yeah. that, having said that, yeah. give your opinion on open space, because then I've got to go to Vicki and Colin right. and Rosa. Well, I would, I'm going to defer to open space to ask that George Jane shares with us a little bit of an, an understanding of what exactly <laughs> the uses are and what is, you know, the pros and cons, not the pros and cons, but if you could describe or Diana, um, what the use groups of the open space district, you know, allow for. So people really understand 
that that wonderful open space in the center could have, in fact, some 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 building on it. And also to talk a little bit about the limits on public access. I don't know that that would be clear to the community. What we're here here for here to here to achieve tonight, Tammy, is to make sure it's crystal clear to the public what the zoning proposal is. Take away the trust. Take away the board. Take away the politics. Just talk about the zoning that's being considered on the island on the governor's island. And is this something? that at this point we can fully support and by voting yes or no you're basically saying not yet for no and yeah this sounds great do a few other things you know you have to be cognizant of how that vote will be read by our electeds um, and by all involved and so i think you know there's clearly obviously a few ways to look at it so without i don't want to go on right now about you know where i may stand on this but i do feel strongly that i would like that the community is crystal clear on the open space issues that are before us and i leave that to diana and george to help us out to describe precisely diana. what that means all Thanks. right can sure. i oh i have one uh joe Tammy, um since she's not since Alice is not appointed yet, can she vote tonight? And why not? Uh, yes. Joe, that's a great question, and we have that out to Coib. So we'll know by the full board. It's not that she can't say her opinion, and I think people will hear her opinion. But I'm not a lawyer, play one on TV, and I have to play by the city rule. So we're, we're waiting on a ruling. Well, I appreciate that. The, expl and it, the explanation that was given to me today was simply that because the appointment, uh, excuse me, the nomination will most likely uh, become an appointment, that that relationship has already been established. Okay. So we're counting on everyone to, you know, engage. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for the support, Joe, and we love that. All right, uh, Anna, do you or George want to take the conversation about open space versus parkland? Yes, parkland. yes. Yeah, I think we both will. Um, I know this is something we spoke about earlier, and I asked George to put together. Um, it's referenced in the zoning resolution, but in the application, it, it references other parts of the text, and it's hard to get a, a full sense of, of the permitted uses in the various areas and the different use groups. So I asked George to put together a compilation of all the permitted uses in the various groups. So, George, I'm going to pull that up and then um, maybe you can speak. I know you did a lot of work in this area about open space, um, the open space sub areas. So maybe you could walk folks a little bit um, through your findings there and then the uh, the specific permitted uses. Oh, okay, sure. Um, yeah, if we can, if you're going to bring it up, that, that would be most useful. Um, so, there are a lot of uses that are allowed in the open space. Um, uh, the, the thing that was really notable for me, as Diana said, is use group 15, right? Use group 15 is Coney Island. Um, and all of the uses in Coney Island um, would be allowed in the open space and buildings up to 35 feet um, or taller, considering um, zoning for coastal resiliency uh, would be permitted obstructions in the open space. Um, so you can have like an amusement park um, in, you know, which is a kind of park, I guess, but I don't think it's the kind of park that folks are really thinking about. Um, and this may not be the trust's intention, right? This just may be bad zoning. Um, but right now it allows for an amusement park. It allows use group 13, which has a, uh, a number of different uh, other types of amusements like theaters. So you could have you know, like a mini Broadway on the island, which, you know, might be nice, but again, it's not the kind of thing that people think about when they think of a park. Um, it has use group 12 for only eating and drinking establishments, larger eating and drinking establishments, or um, with dancing and entertainment. Um, it's a heavier commercial use. It's not like your neighborhood diner or thing like things like that. It's like, you know, nightclubs. And uh, that's something that would be allowed in the open space, along with the buildings associated with that. Um, and then there's like all the accessory uses are also allowed in the open space. And so, you know, I, it's my job being a kind of a zoning person to think of the absolute worst case scenario when I read zoning. Um, and the worst case scenario is, is that um, accessory uses, so you get an amusement park, 
um, a Coney Island style amusement park, or maybe, hey, you know, colonial New York, like colonial Williamsburg, it may actually be more appropriate. Um, and, you know, you can have accessory uses on the open space, and some of those accessory uses could be parking. And so you could have auto ferries coming in for people to go to the amusement park and, uh, and or to the theaters or the nightclubs and stay in the hotels on the island. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's enormously flexible what could happen in the open space. Um, yes, Diana brought it up. Okay, so yeah, there, these, are, these are the use groups or the uses that are allowed. I like the, the one freak shows and wax museums, um, <laughs> which is allowed, um, but also on the piers. Can you scroll down to the piers? So there are different sets of uses that are allowed in piers, and many of them make perfect sense, like docks uh, for boats. But then they have hotels. Hotels are hotels that are designed to be put on docks for boats. So you can take your boat to the island, uh, dock it and then stay in a hotel on the um, on the pier. Again, it wouldn't be counted as floor area. It's not included in the environmental review. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring this to the attention of of Diana is that is that the the environmental review studies development in the development area. The, the zoning allows for all of this development in the open space sub area, which is never studied in the environmental review. And, you know, I, I you know, honestly, it just looks like it was bad zoning. Um, and, and because all of these things are, are allowed there and then not studied, which seems like a mistake, right? If you're gonna allow these things, you've got to study the reasonable worst case scenario where you actually develop this, these, these open spaces with these uses. Um, anyway, so, and there's also heavier, if you could scroll down a little bit more, Diana. So they have, okay. so, so. George, yep. let me Stop. take some, let's take some questions because yep. we can, we can opine on, it's really just yep. a yay or nay kind of a, you know, kind of thing as we're rolling along here. All right, I'm gonna hands up. We said Vicky's going first, then Colin, then Rosa. Vicki. Um, well, I wanted to just get a clarification from you. I wanted to make sort of a statement uh, that um, will, you know, I want to share with my fellow board members that would lead to an explanation on my vote. Something like, uh, um, like Patrick did. Is this an appropriate time to do that? Because I'm not really interested in all the details. And if you hear what I have to say, then you'll know why. Is this a time that I can bring this up? And I'd like this to be in the, um, Resolution. What a, uh, I, I guess so. Okay. Why not? So, I've been listening to this for you know a couple of months now. So, um, being in the design industry for you know three decades, <clears throat> it's not listening to Governor's Island proposal just for the last three or four months, or in architectural world for you know several decades. Um, <clears throat> what has come to what I've come to understand is that my frustration with the proposal today is that it comes um, with what we call in the industry the wrong program. Um, we, I, I don't feel um, that the New, the New Yorkers um, were not adequately asked to make sure there are considerations taken, whether it's via workshops or, you know, questionnaires or whatever we do to decide what is the program on public land. Um, so it, in that context, in that spirit, uh, we were not asked, at least I don't think sufficiently, and the reason that I think I'm right is because we've spent now weeks, um, you know, trudging through these questions and having the trust sort of push back relentlessly on why they're doing what they're doing, and this shouldn't happen if we're all on the same page. So. The idea that the trust comes to us and tells us that this island, this public space that belongs to us needs to be financially independent was a mystery to me from the beginning. Everything here that we do is paid for us by taxes. So why should this land 
all of a sudden become, you know, such a, a hot topic of financial independence. We pay for things we like and we have. Um, when I hear language like anchor tenants, that comes directly from developers. I know this, I work for them, this is how we talk. So how does anchor tenant relate to public uh, ambition such as we want and need, this is what everyone says, open space, unmarked land, places where we can just go and relax. I want to go to Governor's Island and maybe rent a room or, you know, one of those communities that we used to have in the 50s or 60s upstate in Connecticut where you rent a house, but it's not a house, it's like a hotel, you know, and you go there and you swim and uh, pontificate and drink and talk to your friends and maybe go to a show. And um, if that spirit was taken as the primary design driving force on Governor's Island, then all the issues that we're discussing, like the unbelievably high, um, uh, you know, buildings that, that we're proposing, 30, 40 story buildings that cast enormous shadows, um, would not be an issue. Uh, we, we, in my opinion, we are, we are approaching this in the wrong way. We're approaching it as monetizing public land, uh, commercializing it, and then it's being, you know, uh, forced right down the lane, which is why in the end I'm going to vote no, just no, go back to the board, come back and ask people what we think. But what, I know group decisions are very hard, but we can come to some kind of consensus. Vicki? Yeah. Gotcha. I gotcha. You, you got your vote out. I understand where you're at. If you had your choice, you would just be a flat no, period. I get it. All right. No, I don't mean to be cutting people short, but remember it's eight o'clock. We all want to go home before midnight tonight, so we've got to get through as much as we can. Colin. Yeah, I, mean, I have a lot to say, but I'll, I'll spare everyone. I'm with Vicky. Remember, I, we have I, like five, we have five other sections. So this is just open space. Yeah, We're not even at the summary yet. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, we were talking about how to formulate the resolution. That's what I was understanding when I raised yeah. my hand a while back. Yep. But, you know, we do this a lot. We write a resolution. We don't love something, so we fill it up with uh, things that they can't possibly meet, and it might die down the road. But for me, I'm with Vicky. I mean, I would prefer voting on something that's a flat yes or no. Because I just, I it's obvious at this point I'm against this. I'm vehemently against this for a lot of reasons, which I'd love to outline right now, but I won't. But I just don't see a convoluted resolution as the answer here. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Rosa. Hi, um, just in support of the effort to get this change from open space to um, public parkland. I know that open space in the coastal um, zoning resiliency text um, that we were reviewing also specifically stated that all of the flood proofing protections that you would provide um, or you could provide, and this is obviously an affected area, um, would be able to be stored and cover up 100% of open space. Not that I think that that is what you would do, that would be insane, but I'm just saying that that is a possibility per the text. So it would just be so simple if you were to, you, you know, modify it from referring to it as open space and referring to it as public parkland so that that permitted obstruction would no longer be allowed in that type of space. That's it. Fantastic, Rosa. So that's one for public parkland. Um, Paul Goldstein, you're next. And Colin and Rosa, if you'll take your hand down before Paul goes, I promise I'll come back to you if you put it back up. I'm just going over parkland and useless for now. Paul. Okay, I, th I think you guys did a very good job on the uh, open space category as somebody who's worked on that issue for years and obviously we discussed it in committee. I would just say that if we do any kind of resolution with conditions, we should certainly, needless to say, put these provisions in there that we don't want Coney Island amusement parks, et cetera, et cetera, in the resolution. We'll get to details later, but uh, yes, that, that covers it. Thank you. 
I think George was going through all the use groups and I so casually cut him off only because I wanted to get to the first parkland versus open space first. We do need to go through the permitted use groups because it is part of the zoning. Um, and I think that Diana and George will tell us, I, you know, I'm sure that we don't care because they already do have camps and overnight camping on in the spaces. So that would be something that we would, you know, certainly allow, but agree that we don't want amusements. Um, right. Uh, we don't want amusements, period, kind of a thing. Um, no circuses, no carnivals. Uh, we, there was a request for swimming pools. If you remember on the island, um, both by the Harbor school, which is desperate to have a swimming pool and other things like plus pools, whether or not that could come out there. So I'm, those are permitted uses that we had discussed. Um, there was discussion if the committee remembers as well. And Allison coming to you next about beaches and access to the waterfront um and then i will leave the rest of the up there no way okay uh and then george can you answer the question if we make it a recommendation to be parkland versus open space does the zoning apply and do we have to go through these use group conversations? Um, right, zoning does not apply to parks. Um, and so you would not have to go through this at all. Essentially the open space subdistrict would cease to exist. It would be um, parkland under the jurisdiction of New York City Parks and Recreation. That's, that's the definition of parkland essentially. Uh, and yeah, so you would just delete it. You don't have to go through them. Can you answer one of the important conversations that the trust has said over many times is that they would love to be able to do like a band shell to be able to have concerts and things. Would that still be permitted under Parkland? So, so yes, but it just wouldn't be a zoning thing, right? So, so the Department of Parks and Recreation manage their parks. They have swimming pools, they have band shells, they, they have spaces for events and, and where you can get food and bathrooms and things like that. But it's just not done through zoning. Um, and I think like a partnership between the trust and and parks and recreation, like what's happens in Central Park and, uh, and, and you know, in all the in many of the parks uh, has this kind of partnership with uh, Department of Parks and Recreation um, that could address those needs, those things that you want. Alice, you have your hand up. And Paul, you'll go after Alice if you have a second. Yeah, I'm sorry comment. you went back. I, Diane, if you could just pull up the first page. I just thought the organization of this was very helpful. And I'm seeing, you know, I just want to finish with the open space part of the um, list of points that we should be discussing for the resolution. If you, but, so before uses, you had open space up, right? Which uh, uh, George has just acknowledged. Could you talk a little bit about the accessory uses, whether you or Diana, about what that, what, what that means, um, what, you're, what, what we're talking about there? I know an accessory use allowed in the open space is, is That's parking like access. Sorry. development I, zone, but George, can you elaborate on any accessory uses in the open space outside of parking? Uh, well, sure. Uh, so it'd be like maintenance buildings for, um, like if you had a, an amusement park ride, you would have a maintenance building or a shed to store, you know, the, uh, tr you know, tractors for cutting grass or things like that. It's just the, the, the support for the main use you'd be allowed you'd be allowed to maintain sorry so be, I, I asked the so, wrong question but it's a good thing to know about but what i was trying to get to is if diana could you could pull up the page on open space and not uses uh, where we start this discussion and if you could speak on the public act you had a point on public access limits on public access but we didn't really discuss that if you could just clarify what that's talking about she did she did. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize we talked about the um, the streets okay. and connections. Okay, I didn't hear that. She did. I'm sorry. Okay, so, apologies. That's okay. So if I understand, if we ask for parkland instead of open space, parkland is parkland, then we don't have to go through the use groups. 
The question that I have for the people who are not land use experts, like most of us on the CB, is, is that a place that we can stand on in the zoning? If, if your question, what do you, what do you mean? Relevant co comment to make in the zoning, then yes, public parkland is specifically defined in through through zoning. So, if I'm understanding your question, yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Does anybody else have anything, or feel that we need to go through all of the use groups that are here? We'll come back to it um, because it appears again. But does everybody? on the board have any other comment about open space versus parkland just one quick question um yep. does the state have to designate um parkland in addition to the city so according to zoning it's very simple definition if it is on the under the jurisdiction of parks and recreation it is parkland but it's not necessarily under parks and recreation here. No, no. it's not. It is not planned to be. So it, if that's the case, how is there any way to protect it? The way that having its own just parkland. The way that we are suggesting it's that's being discussed at the board is to classify instead of the open space sub area as public parkland, which by its nature defines it as a space that's under the jurisdiction of the Department of Parks and Recreation with the associated protections that affords. All right, so we have to make that clear. Okay, thank you. And Diana, if you can actually make that as super clear as you can in here, because that will be a point for the resolution, is that CB1, correct. All right, thank you, Paul. Anybody else on parkland versus open space? Just a question, is it is the same for Nolan Park? Is the South Island Park, the center area that's been redeveloped, is that the same, um, George or Diana? I don't know. You're the talking? I, I'm assuming it's open, open space um, the way that this would be. George, is that correct? I, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of that. Nolan, Nolan Park, Park on, on the north, north side, could that all, does that, Outside of the, the, you know, the, the restrictions having to review, be reviewed by the Landmarks Preservation Commission, is it also considered an open space area? I think it would be called, yeah, an open area is what I think it is called in the zoning. So it could be subject to also having um, additional, um, oops, sorry, additional um, it could, things built in it, uh, potentially. Yeah, yeah there, there, there are whatnot. different uses. There are different uses, though, in the north. Um, but okay. yes, there uh there, there could be things in it i believe that's, I, I but, believe that's the case yes but that's not in front of us today that part of that is it no that's not part of this zoning application the change that space in the north well there are Correct. changes in the north that are in, in front of you so you are amending the uh governor's island uh, special district and mapping new um, zoning districts, and that includes the northern sub the northern sub district. So you can so, make a comment on that. So we should include Nolan Park in the request that in the open space sub area um, also include the park areas in the north, like no, AKA Nolan Park. Yeah. I don't know that Nolan Park has um, parks to protection or not. I just don't know it well enough. I don't, I'm looking it up online and it does not seem to be a New York City park. So then it wouldn't. No. Okay. Let's move along to the next section for questions. Tammy, Tammy, yep. my, my catering here. I, I have my hand up. Sorry, I guess I put it oh, up. Recently. I didn't see it. My apologies. No, no, no I just put it up recently. Um, Maybe the folks from the trust could clarify this, but my understanding has always been that if something is actually mapped as parkland, it doesn't generate development rights. So, you know, if for those of us who might want to support a a conditional yes, uh, if 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 this if this is the park, if the park area doesn't generate development rights, it might totally undo the 
the plan they're trying to propose here. So it might not be a workable suggestion. I'd like to hear what they have to say about that. Can, in fact, this be considered public parkland and still give them development rights? But we don't want development on the parkland. No, you, no, I understand that. But you, you could have, you could have open spaces that generate development rights with restrictions, as opposed to parkland that might not generate floor area that they need to make. I don't know if right. answers your question, Michael. But the development zones are separate, uh, defined separately from the the open space sub area. So the the spaces on the east and west that are designated for development are are separate from what we are talking about here. Well, I understand that, but do they do they can they do what we're asking them to do? I mean, do they need? I know the the floor area is based upon the, the total space. Is it not for, of the South Island? So, so to clarify, the the floor area ratio in the zoning only applies to the development sites. Okay. The open space sub area generates has a zero FAR. It's just that the buildings are permitted obstructions and generate no floor area. So this would not affect the um, the the two different sub areas. The only thing that it might affect is uh, right now you can float the floor area from one to the other, so you could put it all on one side or the other side. Um, if you had a park in between them, that might separate them into two different zoning lots, which would prevent the floor area from moving from one side to the other. That would I think I that seems to me to be the only downside. Okay, thank but you. Michael, thank you for asking that. That's a great question. And I do believe George at one of the meetings. Um, and again, Claire can affirm this or not, but I do believe the development sites are set as is. And it was for whatever is within that kidney bean shape on each side. And he who gets to the island first <laughs> determines their height and density that takes out of the total per kidney bean. That there is no sharing of the kidney beans across anyway. Claire, is that correct? Um, Chris or Wesley, is there any sharing across the two kidney beans? As George said, you can move FAR across the, the, the FAR cap for the development zones is for the two development zones. So you are able to move it between the, east, the eastern development zone and western development zone. That being said, I don't think the Western Development Zone or either of them could necessarily build out all of the FAR and that I don't think you could build use all the FAR for the development zones on just one of them, but it is like you can go back and forth. I agree. Okay. So the question is whether or not defining it as parkland in the middle would prevent that. Um, I would really have to ask our lawyers to opine on whether map um, defining it as parkland is is feasible. Um, but, you know, we do want to just reiterate that we understand the need to protect the park. And so, you know, everything we've heard about limiting what can be done in the open space sub area, of course, um, we're happy to work with everyone on. Perfect. All right. I think um, unless the committee says otherwise, Based on the comments, including those who would prefer to see nothing at all, we leave it as requested parkland and we put, um, we go to the uses later. Diana, next section. Okay, great. The next uh, blurb is about parking here. Um, uh, parking is optional on each of the development zones for, for up to 150 vehicles each. Um, what we capture here is that while it is a it is reasonable to assume that institutional and or commercial facilities will require a limited amount of vehicle storage to satisfy logistical needs. There is no rational basis to justify an as of right on site parking capacity of up to 150 vehicles on each development parcel in an otherwise vehicle free island. This generous allowance is contrary to the spirit and atmosphere of the island and leaves too much room for exploitation. Allowing future development to include such a number of parking spaces will create incentives to establish more ways for vehicles uh, to access the island for non-essential purposes and create conflicts with park users and disrupt the unique car-free nature to the park as currently enjoyed. 
um, and noted here that delivery trucks and distribution distribution centers and other vehicles the community does not want to see on the island. So specifying the, the type of vehicular uses that the community doesn't want to see. Um, the, the logical conclusion here is that the community board uh, would like to see a reduction in, in parking on the island, but that's for this group to discuss. Okay, hands up. I know there's a long song on that, but any hands up? Oh, I like that. Okay. If we have no comments, then I think it stands as is. Um, okay, then, then I'm clear to conclude that CB1 would like to see a reduction in allowable parking in each development zone. Correct. Yes. Okay, great. We're getting in, into some of the here. Um, next, we're talking about zoning permitted uses, uh, use groups. This this is commenting generally. And George, after we get through this section, I'll switch back to the to the uses. I'd like you to to speak about those as they are allowed outside of the open space sub area a little bit. Um, the board, what we need to do here is talk a little bit specifically about what uses we don't want to see, what which we're not comfortable with, which we're fine with, et cetera. But in general, there have been concerns over the vast permitted uses and in zoning, including inappropriate uses, um, specifically use groups 12, 15, and 18 have been mentioned. The question of industrial uses and what are the non maritime industrial uses? I think for most people, um, some maritime uses fall under industrial, which are likely to be okay with folks. Um, this board typically is, is supportive of maritime type uses, but we need to specify what the non maritime industrial uses are. And then uh, non maritime industrial uses should be removed from permitted uses, which is more appropriate for the island. And which would make the zoning more consistent with the restrictions in the deed. So, George, I'm going to pull up the general use group. I'd, if you could talk a little bit about um, your analysis in that area and what you found, and maybe what areas are unusual um, for this type of development. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk uh, for a second about residential uses because I know that's been a concern. Um, it is fair to say that uh, if you want temporary staff housing and you want to develop it as units, uh, you need residential uses, right? That That is a residential use. Um, it would not be permitted uh, otherwise. Dormitories are community facilities, but, you know, if you have faculty, professors, uh, uh, maintenance people, they might want to live in a unit rather than in a dormitory. Um, and so that would be a, a residential use and it is allowed. And it's also allowed under the deed um, uh, to allow that kind of housing. So, I mean, but there's a whole range of other uses that are allowed here, you know, um, hotels, almost everything from use group six, uh, which is, you know, a lot, all your small commercial uses, offices, um, but scroll down, I mean, you would expect most of these things to be allowed uh, here. A very, you know, they're, they're broad, but, you know, use group six is allowed in most commercial zones. Uh, so keep scrolling. And these are all use group six, and it gets very detailed <laughs> when you get to zoning. Um, but when, really, when you get into higher numbers, these are things where you start going, hmm, that's interesting. Um, so use group well, seven. Go back up. Sorry, I can't read that fast. Okay. Nope. Um, but yeah, these are all use group six. Again, it, it's it's your typical um, small scale commercial for the most part, except for things like you know you do have um, some accessory type uses like water and sewage pumping stations, which would be very small. Um, but things that uh, that are you know essentially allow a city to function. But if you scroll down to the higher numbers. You'll get to think, see things that you might want to ask questions about. Um, so I would say there's use script seven, which is slightly higher. You have like motels as opposed to hotels in there. Um, use group eight is another one of these. Uh, eight A is one of these. Uh, 
uh, entertainment. So uh, billiard parlors, pool halls, bowling alleys, um, theaters, music group 9A, banquet halls, um, again, heavier commercial uses, uh, uh, wedding chapels, business schools, catering establishments, 10A, um, is docks for ferries, which makes perfect sense. Uh, uh, eating and drinks, larger eating and drinking spaces, uh, motion picture production studios. Um, scrolling, keep scrolling. Basically, a small city. Well, I mean, it's it's very flexible. Let's put it this yes. way. There's, yes, yes, yes. I think it's designed to be flexible, and want. we have flexible zoning districts, right? And typically they're, they're M districts, which are, are very flexible. Um, but this is, um, this is a C district that's very flexible. So you have, you know, some stores keep going. 11 is, 11 is uh, manufacturing, but it's like pre precision, like metalworking, needlework, book binding, uh, things like that. So jewelry manufacturing is 11, it's all allowed or much of it is allowed. Um, and then we have some wholesale trade uh, in use group 11, use group 12. Um, so again, more entertainment, billiard. Some of these are, were limited by size for one to the other, but you have things like um, indoor golf centers and historical exhibits. Um, stadiums with a capacity limited to 2,500 seats will be allowed in the northern subdistrict. Uh, the historic part is allowing stadiums. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uses. <laughs> uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, uses that are allowed. If you want to keep scrolling, we can go through them one by one, but there are, there are hundreds of them. Uh, use group 13 and 14 are again more these amusements, right? Where you have um, circuses, carnivals, a uh, commercial beach is swimming pools, which I hear what people want. Um, miniature golf, golf driving ranges, roller skating, outdoor skateboard parks, theaters. Theaters, like uh, again, we're talking like uh, Broadway theaters or live, or I think, um, uh, yeah, like a, a positive. Also, um, theaters or film. Uh, I think, George, I think if we're going to, in the top, we say parkland, but I do think that, you know, we need to put something in here. There have been a couple things that people have already said that they didn't want, like amusement parks and things like that. So I do think we need to put in something that says, within the permitted use groups, here are things that CB1 strenuously objects to. Yeah, you should. You um, should and and some, pe some people will say, I strenuously object to any use group, and I understand that, and that comes to a discussion, but we also need to say, um, if it passes with use groups, we need to ensure that we've opined on the use groups we do not. Yes. That's the way to do it. And, you know, you should, um, I know that it was getting along there, but, but 16, 17 and 18 are the industrial ones. Um, and those yep. are the ones that are, I think of, you know, they're, they're the more concerning. There aren't that many of them, but, you know, typically 17 and 18 are only allowed in M districts, right? They, they're not even allowed in commercial districts, uh, but we have a bunch of M uses that will be allowed here. Now, they don't look terrible, and some of these are maritime, uh, but, you know, ultimately manufacturer, manufacturing of pharmaceuticals, um, chemical compounding and pack, uh, packaging. These are things we typically only do in M districts. Manufacturing of alcoholic beverages and breweries, marine transfer stations, uh, sewage disposal plants, which is something that uh, caught my eye, uh, is is an allowed use. So I, those are those are uses that you know. If I were to point out uses to you um, that you might want to pay attention to, those would be some. Okay, let's open it up to questions. And because I do know that there are some uses, Diana, keep going down that are prohibited in the deed that it would be allowed through zoning. 
that the community has already said, no, I don't think so. Sure. So this so, next. Right, keep going. This next section uh, refers to um, deed prohibited uses. So we're traveling outside of the zoning now and going back to the deed. Um, CB1 learned fairly recently that the provision of the deed that limits uh, or prohibits certain uses, um, in, including permanent or long term residential, expires in 2060 or 50 years from uh, the master plan effective date, which is 2010. Um, through this process, the zoning should create a prohibition on permanent long term housing and certain other deed prohibited uses and ban them in perpetuity. And I, I wouldn't say that the board should advocate for all of the prohibited uses banned in perpetuity. They do include things like industrial or manufacturing that the community might ha have a problem with, um, uh, parking, probably some power uses. But from what I have heard so far, it sounds like um, there is a consensus in uh, permanently prohibiting long-term permanent residential uses and, and at the very least casino or gaming uses. So, in this case, we would advocate that it's either or or both advocate for both that the provision is worked into the zoning that that mimics this prohibition in a way that's permanent or um, also advocate that there's an amendment to the deed that makes those permanent rather than temporary. Okay. All right, hands up. Anybody has a question on uses? I already know where Vicki and Colin are on this. Anybody else? I, I just want to confirm that what you said, uh, George, is that you could have a small, I don't know, small 2,500 person stadium on the North Island. Yeah. I mean, right part of the island, excuse me. Uh, yeah, up to 2,500 people on the north part of the island stadiums would be allowed. Where could that go? I, mean, I, I don't know. If, you mean, so if Landmarks approved it, well, it could go in Nolan Park? I, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I think theoretically, yes. But remember, it does, it's up to 2,500, so it could be, you know, 200, right? Yeah, oh, I understand. I just, I, I can never get that straight. Okay, thanks. Okay, Rosa, you're next. Hi, um, this is a question for the trust. Um, so I noticed that there was a specific um, uh, mention of furniture making and also, I guess, alcohol breweries. Um, I was wondering if that was intentional for, or what the intent was, because I mean, obviously furniture making is, but it also generates a lot of pollution and noise. And it is a, you know, very heavy industrial manufacturing kind of use. That was it. Uh, sure. Um, thanks, Rosa. The reason that's included is, um, you know, some of these zoning groups, and I'm sure George would um, agree with this, are or date back to the 1960s. Um, and so that's why you get such funny things as I think one of the zoning groups in the code is like wig making. Um, so the, the the part of the reason we had that in is in case we were able to attract some R&D um, in association with the climate center where, you know, maybe they're not building a table, but, um, you know, you might need a wood shop or something like this. I would note that in the EIS, it re obviously requires that all um, that they be the highest environmental standards and then there are separate approval processes with the Department of Environmental Conservation um, for, you know, any and all uses and typically in manufacturing groups. Um, and there's also provisions for separation of uses. Um, in general, I would note, obviously, I think everyone knows this, but the North Island was zoned in 2013. This current proposal does not change anything with respect to the North Island. Um, and um, I just wanted to make that clear because we were not proposing stadiums for the South Island and um, in the yeah, use groups that are laid out here are really um, at, almost mirror the North Island and are really meant to um, allow for what's allowable under this deed. Sorry, Wesley, I, I think it is important to just hear Wesley say one thing on this matter. Yes, I, I was just gonna note on the question of stadiums, section 134, 111, of use group 12 uses, it specifically prohibits stadium uses, both on the North Island and the South Island. 
So just a, a in one the correction south, there. The south Island it prohibits. Yes, yeah, south, south Island, all uses from use group 12A are permitted ex except stadiums. And right. in the Northern Subdistrict, and we're not, again, as Claire said, we're not touching, we're not proposing to touch what already exists for the North Island. Uh, if you go to the end of that section for the North Island uses, stadiums are prohibited on, on the North Island. But again, that's existing zoning. We just wanted to clarify that because we know it's an area of specific concern for folks. Okay, but the one question, the one point though I would make about the manufacturing uses that needs to be mm -hmm. up is that um, they are all required to be M1 performance standards. So even if they're a heavy use, um, that means they can't have a lot of noxious, yeah. um, uh, you know, offensive, you know, vibrations, so smells, sounds like that. So um, that that's written into the zoning. So there is a limitation on on the intensity of the or the negative effects. I guess is is what it is. And I will. Um, if I made a mistake on the stadiums, I will. No, no, no. Please. Okay. Go, go forward. I just get uh, clarity while we have Claire engaged on this. I'm sorry on the on the concept of the North Island. It isn't as if this is two islands. It's one island, and maybe the yeah. zoning is looking more specifically, of course, at the south. But could you just clarify and confirm that there is additional square footage that could be built on the North Island if in the landmarked area, the historic district, not the federal, that could be built on if landmarks deemed it appropriate. Is that correct? And how many square feet would that be? Sure. Thanks, Alice. So, um, I, I might have to come back to you on the exact square footage, but the 20, the 2013 special district that was approved and mapped basically kept the underlying R32 district, but expanded pretty, I don't want to use it dramatically, but expanded significantly the use, the list of allowable uses. So, my belief is that the FAR on the North Island um, remains that underlying R32, which is 0.5 for residential and 1.0 for community facility. For the new use groups that were mapped, I'm not sure off the top of my head what the FAR governing it is. And then, Alice, you're absolutely right that obviously really anything that would expand a building or be a new building on the North Island goes through a full landmarks review, which is indeed quite rigorous. It could be built, and could anything built be built in the, the parade ground? Is that at all, um, uh, you know, not allowable, or is that part of the federal, or just you know the no. parade ground in Nolan Park? Not. So I will start by saying, I don't ever see that happening, but there is nothing in the zoning that precludes that. Okay, it could be built on. Okay. And for the record, Wesley is right. I'm sorry, I put that together too quickly, and I left stadiums in in the north. Tammy, I have a question for Stacey. Tammy, you're also muted. I'm not muted. Yes, Tammy is muted. It appears that she's trying to speak. Tammy, we can't hear you. You're muted. Okay, Bob and then Vicki. Thank you. I Bob guess it, yes, am, am I on? Yes, thank it you. Seemed, it seemed like George mentioned the concern with um, experimental purposes. And so I just wanted to clarify that. Are we, as a community board, excluding, thinking of excluding things like experimental purposes? It, it seemed to me as though if you had an eco center that was academic, it would, it, of of essence, be involved with research. Also, he seemed to express a concern with uh, with uh, sewage facilities, and I can imagine small scale, scale eco experiments to kind of think about how to how to do better uh, sewage management. So that's just a question: Is our intent to exclude those kinds of purposes? I don't I don't think we have an intent on that at all, Bob. I don't think that's, you know, part and parcel to that. No. I think those the question are, the, the question are, the question is, you know, how I I think it's a size question, right? 
right? If, 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 you know, are, when I, you're looking at. Sorry, Diana here. Bob, I think I get what you're saying. And, and if you're referencing um, it, specifically this use group 17, the chemical compounding or packaging and or sewage disposal plans. Um, in this section, in our resolution draft or framework about um, use groups, I think it would be fair to say that we have concerns or don't want to see uses group 17 or 18 that may have adverse environmental impacts. Does that answer? And it's not included yet, but if there's consensus on that, I, I think that's a perfectly fine thing to add. Uh, we, we certainly don't want adverse environmental impacts. But I just wanted to make sure that research facilities are at least allowable. And we're not trying to exclude them. Oh, I see what you're saying. They are listed in this use group 17 as research experimental or testing laboratories. Right. And it seemed like we we're trying to exclude them. And so I went, well, I'm not sure I would like to exclude them. It's it's not then then. Tammy, I think you were starting to answer that question. No, we are not heading. It's not included right now. I think George cited it as a point of interest for people, but that's not included in our um, in what we have so far. Well, it is included as a use group that no one has objected to yet. And not hearing any objections, we would move forward without eliminating any of that. That makes Good. sense. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Any any other questions? Nope. Okay. Bob's off. Uh, then that's Vicky. Um, I have a two part question for Claire. So Claire, if, uh, to pick up on analysis thing, um, in the north part, if there is an uh, uh, an expansion, and you said it would go through LPC. Does that mean that public engagement, like community boards, would be able to comment as well, or is this directly goes to LPC? And then I have a second question. Um, so, for the North Island, yes, it would go through LPC. It would also um, go to our board. Um, no, I'm asking about public engagement, our board. Chris, do you have um, yeah, we yeah, anything going before LPC has a hearing at? In the board, community board. that's so that's the same across the city. Board. Correct. So it's a community board. Okay. Yeah. So All okay. North Island goes to the community board. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Chris said what I was going to say, but I think um, the last uh, major project on the North Island that went to CB1 on, um, in the historic district was um, LMCC's Art Center, which opened last year. Mm -hmm. So here we are going through this thing, and we have to get George's input. Can you tell me, Claire, why you didn't come up with all of this like forward when you presented the project? Um, is there a reason that this use, all the uses that were a potential use, and we all know they can all be used? Why weren't we informed? Why why do we have why did we have to go through the process of having George analyze all the uses so that we can break it all down? What why didn't you just come and tell us all of this? Um, well, we actually we did have a we did have some slides at the presentations, um, which we are happy to refer folks back to that um, go through each use group and and list out what's allowed. Um, we're we're I think through this clearly that wasn't done well because we wouldn't be sitting here going oh my god we're gonna have a Ferris wheel but we'd be lucky to get a Ferris wheel can you imagine if we went to Central Park and said you know what we're gonna put a Ferris wheel in some gambling houses Vicki on just to be fair on October 15th in the presentation on slide uh -huh. 75 which is on the community board I believe is on the community board's website we listed every single use that's allowed um, with a description it wasn't necessarily as as detailed as, as George's, but you know our our intent was to be transparent and then to be available for questions anytime since October about you know what those use groups were or why we were including them in the district. But we were really clear about exactly what uses were allowed in the district. What you did was just sort of mention that there are uses, but most people who don't know how to read the zoning text, which is probably what, 1500 pages, wouldn't think of going to see what use 15 is, right? And the, 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 the list that George provided for us to work with 
is a big surprise. So whatever you did didn't work because it surprised us. Well, it yeah, didn't surprise Vicky, us, it surprised the rest of us. Vicky, thank yes, you, Vicky. Yes, Vicky. Yes, do you, have, Vicky, darling? Do you have any things that you would like to exclude or comments that you want to add on the use scripts? Now that we know just all about, of it, just about everything. Whatever we have in Central Park, what is wrong with using a governor's island? Do you know for a comical interlude <clears throat> when Olmsted designed Central Park, whether it was him or the city or the city and him? Do you know that they went as far as dictating the dress code? um in central park i always found that funny um because people care they wanted to have a certain lifestyle so my point is whatever we can have in central park we should think as a good precedent for governor's island or um god i'm so i'm going so crazy what is the parking in, in park slope uh, you know any of those parks i would like to have that rather than the monetizing that is a potential um on this um on, on governor's island thank you thank you vicky i'm sorry to interrupt i just want to say though that we do have all the uses listed in the application that they submitted for this exactly it's 167 clear. pages or 67 or whatever you know when i present the project i say hey i'm thinking of doing this and this is what we can do what do you all think it is hard but, for a community board of non zoning specialist architects planners to dig into this. So we have to do a lot of work to to, uh, you know, pour over your documents to really understand what you mean, what or what the possibilities are that could come our way. I mean, you are also New Yorkers, you know, it's not like we're separate. Uh, 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 okay. Rosa. Not the Governor's uh, Island Trust. This is Rosa. Come yeah, yeah, yeah. Ro Rosa, Rosa. exactly. Thank you, right, Rosa. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let, Rosa. Okay. Done. I, you know, I don't. I don't disagree that we were never asked what we wanted, and it was never like uh, you know uh, there was there was not a type of engagement that said here are all the use groups. Tell us in advance that there's something that's concerning. Right, exactly. I get where you're at. That kind of engagement has not happened and never did happen. Okay. And that's, that is something that we're gonna try and address here at the best that we can. Okay, all right, uh, moving on. All right, which goes directly into, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> okay, within the permitted use group, CB1 did not wanna see things that were prohibited in the deed that would be allowed now. So we found out this fall, after many, many dialogues and meetings over years and things that deed restrictions are going away. So what we heard loud and clear from the meetings that the zoning should create a prohibition on the permanent long-term housing and other deed prohibited uses and ban them in perpetuity. So the deed restrictions are residential except otherwise permitted herein, which includes housing, but does not include permanent housing, industrial and manufacturing uses. Now that is now allowed. Um, casino or gambling, including the docking of vessels to be used wholly or partially for casino and gambling, parking except maintenance, which we've already opined on and the operation, if that goes, an electric power generating, excluding power for the island, which when the option presented, they specifically said, you know, they couldn't, for example, take the, take the zones and turn them into giant electrical stations that supported other places. It was really only for generating power for the island. Does anybody have any thoughts or concerns about any of that other than has already been expressed? Fantastic. Moving along. Diana. Okay. So to close the loop on a couple of those, uh, I mean, we didn't specifically get uses that the CB doesn't want to see. Um, it sounds like there's consensus on on the fact that the community board feels like they weren't sufficiently sufficiently engaged on what uses they did want to see um, and what what uses they were comfortable with or not comfortable with. Is is that fair to add? 
I think that's fair to add because we've heard that before. Um, and it, I think no, nobody wanted the amusement parks. That was pretty easy to see. There were other things in the permitted uses that were that people had complained about that are in the public comment. And then for uh, the deed prohibited uses, it it sounds like we want to capture a residential and casino in terms of what prohibitions we would like to see be made permanent. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Does anybody have anything else on that one? Hi, this is Rosa. I mean, it's related, but going back again to the FAR for the residential use. Um, I'm wondering if I, I totally get that, you know, you need faculty housing if you have an educational facility there, um, but 715,000 square feet or zoning square feet of faculty housing seems excessive and caretaking housing. Caretaking housing is actually allowed anyway, it's as of right. So I believe in your deed. And, um, and so I'm wondering if maybe a way that we could feel more in tune with each other on this one would be a lowering of what that FAR is to something that would be more reasonable and that we felt could not then be abused in the future um, after the deed restriction expires to suddenly explode into residential, if you know what I'm saying. I don't know. Thoughts? Just putting that out there. I'm thinking. Uh, it's it's really a matter of process for what needs to go in here. I mean, we're saying that we don't we don't want permanent residential housing. Period. End of statement. You know, much like the deed restriction, we are we've already been on record in God knows how many resolutions and things like that about that. So we'd like to perm to not permit that within the zoning period. So you're saying you would not allow faculty housing? It would have to be in dorm housing. Okay. Right? Well, yeah, because then that would be qualified as, as community facility <laughs> rather than residential use. Although I don't know if you're actually allowed to house faculty. I, I don't know. That gets a little bit too nerdy even for me. I think part and parcel to the problem here is if you're, uh, you know, if you're a professor and you're, let's say, living out at, at on the campus for the 30, 25 years, is that still considered temporary housing? And according to the zoning, it is. Right, Rosa? Um, well, if you're in dormitory housing, then it's considered community facility housing. So it's completely different. But how large of a faculty? I mean, that's part and parcel of the question here. Well, you know, is, fa is, is faculty housing 200 apartments? You know, does that violate the spirit of the no permanent housing? And if so, does that mean that, you know, they need to be sort of dormed like students, that there's one building for faculty housing only. Well, I mean, I, I, that gets into other discussions that I don't think we need to have here because it's not specific to zoning text. But I mean, per, somebody from the trust, could you opine on how much faculty housing you think you actually need to make this a successful venture? Because I, I would say that it would be difficult, frankly, to convince faculty, at least top tier faculty, to come in for something mm -hmm. like this if you were not able to provide them with appropriate housing for them and their families. And so that would be a challenge to the success of this entire endeavor if they couldn't get the appropriate faculty in, which is not what we want to do. But we also don't want it so that you have 715,000 square feet of 
faculty housing when in reality, maybe you need, you know, 150,000 square feet. Yeah, um, th thanks Rosa for that. I, I do think it would be ex ex extremely challenging to say the least to ask a faculty member to live in a dorm, particularly as you know, many might have families or um, small kids or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, um, so I, I, I do think we need some amount of residential housing to make this at all feasible. And I'm saying residential in the case, um, this case, I would also note that in the deed faculty housing is um, called out specifically as a um, um, it's in the required use bucket with education. So I think there was an acknowledgement as far back as that, that to make education work, you would need to provide faculty housing. I don't have an exact like bare minimum um, number for you, but um, you know, like I, I understand, I assume later in this document, we ha obviously haven't seen it. There's going to be a request for an overall density reduction. Um, and I think, um, you know, to, to allow for some amount of faculty housing, some amount of caretaker housing, which would be at least required as a zoning category and some amount of artist residency housing is important to making this a vibrant, successful space. Okay, uh, just for the record, I'm not opposed to the faculty housing. I'm just, I'm- Yeah, no, thank you, Rosario. No, seriously, yeah, I get it. Yeah. So the question becomes, what are we doing with that and how are we reflecting the preferences of the community for not having permanent housing in the zoning with the FAR. If because that does not no longer has to do with faculty housing. Faculty housing is permitted, is permitted as of right. So then we're talking about the FAR for the residential housing, which could be, you know, a, re a luxury residential building with 800 units. You could put limitations on the residential housing. So, for instance, you could say you could say tie it as an accessory use to the educational component, um, and say that it's I don't know. I don't want to go too legally or whatever, but um, you could basically tie it up so that it is only able to be used for the educational facility as an accessory use. Is that more the intent that you're looking for? That sounds like the intent that we talked about, yes. Because, you know, the existing FAR for residential is what the existing R3-2 district has. But that doesn't mean that we have to include it. I mean, I think the only way to have the faculty housing is to say that, you know, that FAR should be used only for that which would tie the two together and take care of the dialogue. That makes sense? That makes sense to me. Anybody else have any comments on it? Vicki, I see a hand up. Okay. And so then we- Vicky, are we adding a, are we adding a specific on the the, the non-permanent residential? Well, we're saying that the 0.5 FAR for residential housing should be used for the fact, you know, as the faculty housing and not for any other permanent housing. Okay. We've already gone on record saying that we don't want casinos. We don't want amusement parks. And I think if I understand Claire's earlier comment, they're actually going to go back and um, reevaluate how much FAR they think they would legitimately need, plus, I'm guessing, a buffer um, for faculty housing. But we can, we can go on record saying that, you know, we believe it, shouldn't ex it should not exceed, and that's what this FAR should be used for. Yes. And that way, when the deed restriction goes away, it's tied to the university housing and it's not tied to brand new construction. Yes. Okay. Keep going, D. Diana. Excellent. All right. The next section is on resiliency and sustainability. Um, we do get into this as it relates to, to 
morning here. Um, I will remind people that in February during and um, after the CPC, the city planning commission hearing, there will be an opportunity to provide specific comment on the DEIS and, and we plan to do so. Um, so we're trying to capture here um, the environmental components that are most specifically related to the zoning. So for resiliency and sustainability, we have large scale development of this open scale is neither climate friendly friendly nor resilient um, we heard that comment co come up quite a bit in the last month uh, more recently there's a concern over building in the one percent floodplain especially after reviewing um, zfcr which is zoning for coastal flood resiliency um, we vote on that on wednesday at executive committee this is quoted in some areas where flood risk is exceptional including where sea level rise will lead to a, a future daily tidal flooding there is a need to limit future density to decrease the exposure to damage and disruption and uh, wouldn't part of the coast of Governor's Island be considered um, this location. Given the trust's mission to become a global hub for discussions about innovations on climate change, it seems critical that the plans for sustainability and resiliency for the island be more robust and specific in how the plans will adhere to the most innovative, significant global resiliency and sustainability principles on a national and local level. And then specifically for waterfront access, a plan has not yet been articulated for exactly how the waterfront will be used. The plan is not sufficiently detailed uh, access to the water. The community prioritizes access to the water and maritime opportunities. A plan for the waterfront has not been articulated enough for the community to be able to make a determination. And CB1 calls for a better articulation in the zoning of how the waterfront will be used, including specifically plan interfaces with the Waterfront Revitalization Program and Waterfront Alliance Maritime Activation Plan. Uh, we can include references, uh, the original intentions of the deed and other earlier plans, which make explicit the requirements for engaging, uh, for engaging the waterfront. Okay. Any question? Uh, Colin, hands up. Go ahead, Colin. Well, I figured uh, if you're going to do this, I might as well sound off on it. Um, I would just ask they commit to distributed source power on site with uh, utility or distributed scale storage uh, within five years of inception. Slowly, for those of us who are hearing impaired at this point. <laughs> Sorry. I would ask that the development um, seek and secure uh, distributed scale sources of renewable energy generation. Can you Colin, can, can you can you e can you write that out and email that to me? <laughs> Sorry, sure I'm I talking don't. industry speak. Basically, <laughs> basically, I'm just trying to get them to commit to uh, being self-sufficient power-wise. Um, I'm happy to. I mean, I'm still going to vote against this, but, <laughs> but I'm happy to work with them to figure out what that would sound like. It's it's completely doable. And okay, Colin, write it up and send it to the. Uh, the host, and I'll share it back with Diana. But, but yeah, could, I just said that. Back, Colin, here, could you just describe, Colin? Could you flesh that out a little for uh, for the for us? Uh, what 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 you mean a little bit? You know, in like four sentences to spare everybody, spare everybody a little bit. Yeah, uh, there is absolutely an ability for them to be off grid uh, in you know five to seven years or similar or something like that. Um, uh, at least part of it because it's such a big development. Um, one thing they can't do, I don't think, is generate enough power through distributed sources to power the development, but they can absolutely store it. So, again, I'm trying to make this short. I have a, several clients that work in utility scale storage where you can store enough power in a box the size of an 18-wheeler for five to ten hours. So, the city actually needs, this is really complicated, the city actually needs peaker, plow, uh, peaker plant power for blackouts. So one cross solution here is for them to be an example of that and put utility scale storage on site on the island, not just for the island, but also for lower Manhattan. Sorry, this is complex stuff, but I can write it up. Just want to be sure that it doesn't contradict what's allowable on the island. That's not allowed on the island. Well, there you go. Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Colin. But there should be some language about self-sustaining power source gener uh, generation and storage. Colin, write it up a little differently. 
They they massage their stuff. You can massage yours. All right. Uh, okay. I got lots of hands up. Wendy Chapman, you're next. And then Rosa will come back to you. Oh, no, Rosa's. Oh, yeah. Hey. Wendy disappeared. Rosa, your hand's still there. Up. Sorry about uh -huh. that. Um, sorry, I just uh, I'm unmuting it took a little while. Apologize um, to Colin's point. I think especially because the purpose is a, you know, a climate center. I think if we can't figure out the big thing, which is, you know, climate center has to mean energy and, you know, uh, carbon and all of those other things. So if you can have a chemical, you know, processing, manufacturing, light manufacturing on there, we have to be able to write this up in a way that, um, and maybe Colin can work on that. But I just think that that I don't understand how you can both want a climate center and then not have the model of what we're all looking forward, you know, going forward. The Tesla and other batteries and this type of thing going forward. We have to figure this out. So, uh, you know, anyway, that's my two cents. I mean, look, not to belabor this, I really, I really want to get moving on this, but I could be a lot. <laughs> I could be persuaded to vote for something like this if the island truly was an example of how you can be a shining beacon of renewable energy. And that's an important thing that New York can't solve. So why aren't we why aren't we saying yes and adding it? I mean, truly that's part of the problem that we have with the entire proposal that I keep hearing is that there's no teeth behind the climate center. There's no requirements. The zoning doesn't really care. If you're going to be able to say yes to a chemical plant, Right, <laughs> however you want to put it, then how is that going to be resilient and how is that going to work with a uh, long term lowering of emissions and goals? Right. So, figure it out and let's stick it in. I have no troubles with that. I've heard that many times from many people, not just Colin, not just Wendy. I, and look, I offered it before and I didn't hear from anybody and I'll offer it again. I can't actually be considered an expert on this. If they want to reach out to me, I'm happy to talk to them and try just to figure out something. Right. Yep, just write up the thing to go there because we're I'm not, you know, we're, we're in zoning. That's where we are today. Yep. Thank you, Wendy. All righty, Bob Schneck. I just wanted to stand behind the general idea of of being a model of sustainability and of the technologies that support it. So I just think I just support language like that in this. Good. Rosa, hands still up. I know that's because I want to speak. Um, sorry, guys. I, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna have somebody feed you dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm getting a little lightheaded. Actually, I do need to eat, but. Um, I am 100% in agreement with Wendy and Colin on this, that what would make it really exciting for us is if you said we are going to do this thing that has never been done before and we are going to become this model of self-sufficiency, not just financially, but power-wise as well. And that, that would actually make us excited about this project, especially mm -hmm. given what you're saying the academic mission would be. That would make it all just roll together and make it something that we could get behind. So, um, and then I'm wondering also, Colin, back to your point about the feeding um, being an emergency thing. I don't know if this works, but the, there's a restriction on producing power for anything other than the running of the actual island. But I'm wondering if you can do a grid exchange, if that might be a way to get around that. And then um, that's a question for Claire. Okay, so then they feed into the system and then pull out from the system when they need to. And then the last question is, I mean, how long does it take for you guys to recover from a flooding event? Because my concern about sustainability and re specifically resiliency here is that when you look at the coastal, you know, resiliency text, and I'm imagining that you guys will get completely inundated in a flooding situation, then. Mm -hmm. Why, why am I on the rendering seeing the land the, that the buildings are, you know, going to be on, you know, significantly higher than the land that the pedestrians are going to be on or the open park land space. And I understand that it's there to be able to accept the water, but if it's out of commission for, you know, weeks, because you have to repair it after a flooding event, then it's not, you know, great. I'm sorry. I do need some food. My brain is falling asleep. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, um, 
Well, that does then leads me perfectly down to waterfront access. So thank you very much because um, and there we go. Yeah. Wait, but can Claire answer the question about the grid part? Is that possible? Oh, yeah, thank you. Sorry, thank you. Um, I wasn't sure if Tammy wanted to move on. Um, yes, I believe that that is possible. So we can definitely do, as folks know, power generation for use on island. Um, and I suspect that there's a way that um, we'll we're going to work with Wesley on this, but I just got a message from him that, um, you know, to the extent it's storage related, there may be ways to make exceptions or frankly, it may just be possible to change the, the zoning text. The issue will be um, ensuring that it's in compliance with the deed, which as Tammy noted earlier, does specifically say um, this type of power is okay. So in, in, in this case, it's more related to the deed than the zoning. Um, but I do just want to underscore Rosa that um, that this is the part of the project we are also excited about. And so um, uh, glad that folks are talking about this and um, very much excited to see language in here about these environmental and sustainability goals. Hey, Tammy, just a quick point of clarification, if I could yeah. just ask. Uh, Claire, is the is the um, restriction on storage, is that referring to the Tesla power wall and the, the issues of flammability? And no, it's not that. It's, you know, the deed when it was drafted 2005, there just is a lot of gray area. Um, and so I think we would need a f sort of more formal legal opinion from Freed Frank about whether or not doing battery storage w for uses in lower Manhattan would um, open us up to theoretically a lawsuit or a, de a violation of the deed gotcha. issue. But gotcha. from a sort of regulatory and zoning point of view, those things are all totally tackleable. Thanks. Sure. Okay. This is positive. Okay, uh, Bob went, Rosa went next. Let's uh, do waterfront access um, because it also has to do with the conversations that we've had with resiliency and flooding and um, having a walkway by the water versus having um, integration and connection to directly. Um, and we've not seen a plan for exactly how the waterfront will be used. Um, the plan doesn't show sufficient detailed access to the water, meaning beyond the piers um, and one or two locations, I believe, that were potential discussions. Um, and we wanted to prioritize water and marine opportunities. So we want a better articulation for the waterfront. You can see how we tried to, I think we all got a little tired when we were getting to this point, um, but how the waterfront revitalization program and the Waterfront Alliance Maritime Activation Plan, which does reference intentions of the deed and other earlier plans, which made explicit requirements for engaging for the waterfront. Any, but Wendy, you're up. Wendy, then Alice. Go, Wendy. Wendy, I'm going to unmute you myself. Wendy. Thank, thank you. Can you hear me now? I can. Thank you. I was really struggling with that. It wasn't working on my end. Um, so uh, waterfront access is is critical just to what you're saying, you know, wedge design, this type of thing that we learn about over and over again. But the other piece of it, and, you know, I apologize if I missed it with what I read, I, is when they're actually building all of this stuff, are they barging in everything or is it getting truck through Manhattan and then being put on, you know, a, 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 a truck and then being put across, is everything going through Manhattan or Brooklyn once they're building it or are they barging things in? Um, I think that matters a lot in terms of just the impact of whatever they're going to build on the island or is that out of the scope of what we're talking about here, especially if it's going to be a, a very tall tower. Very good question, Wendy. Thank you. Constructability, very big problem. Claire or Chris, any com any sure. feedback on that? Um, I'll start and then Chris, please finish. Um, so our biggest construction project to date was, of course, the park. Um, the vast majority of those materials were indeed barged in, um, and our um, 
analysis here and our um, the, the way we intend to go about construction in the future is to have whatever's barged as much as is possible to barge be barged. Um, currently, the spot is under construction and that does primarily go through the BMB. Um, but for the South Island development and larger scale developments, the intent is to barge construction materials. I, and Claire, I would just add that, you know, that was really successful. Barging was very successful for Roosevelt Island's Cornell Tech development um, and also some of the housing on the southern half of the island there. It's just proved cheaper, um, obviously less impactful to people living and using those areas, but also cheaper when you're doing, you know, reaching up volume. So that, that would certainly be our, our plan. And uh, on that, I know we talk about sustainability again, but, you know, all of the buildings and all the materials that are being, you know, brought in, I think needs to have that, you know, it really needs to be what we say in terms of it needs to be forward thinking and what the future should be. Um, mm -hmm. I know you can't know who's going to develop it and it's going to be going to the highest bidder, whoever can pay, but it's going to be really disappointing if it's just another glass tower. Um, mm -hmm. And on on a separate note, uh, I just put in a little uh, pitch again for the Harbor School, because um, the Harbor School, you know, as you know, is looking for uh, more access to the docks and waterfront access. And, you know, they're doing so much and, you know, they should be uh, part of every thought process when you're, you know, building a new dock or if there's a pool that they want to float in there or if they want to just do something with the Billion Oyster Project. like. You know, I think that they need to be included in this in creative ways, including how this place is being developed and how it's being trucked in. And, you know, they're going to be the the uh, the drivers of these boats and maritime, uh, you know, the, the, the educational piece of it. I know it's separate. This isn't the, the, the you know, exactly what we're talking about, it, but I just want to bring that up one more time. Yeah. Um, sorry, I know this isn't. Um... Not really a question, but that's another area where we are 1000% committed and excited to um, make sure that that is fully integrated into every aspect of the plan and um, and island life going forward. Thank you. Okay, Alice. Just a quick point to add there um, in this section would be the commitment that the, the trust had made um, in the last proposal for the tidal wetland area to be zoned as such, as I recall, and I know we had a conversation about it um, at an earlier time, and I think that should certainly reappear here, and it's an important spot on the southern tip of the island. So, yeah. Uh, what specifically do you want to reference about the tidal the wetland tidal, area? The tidal wetland that had, am I, I, and the trust can, um, Correct me, but I thought that on an earlier proposal, there was an area that was specifically for a step down to a tidal wetland that has been removed from this plan. Uh, um, and I think it should be reinstated, you know, given can, our interest um, in accessing the waterfront. I may have that wrong, but I think I'm, I have to, I can't pull it up right now, but it's somewhere. <laughs> it was on, it was on the, it, it was on the, one of the presentation slides. I just don't know if it was codified in as absolutely. Well, anyway, uh, we we can. I can confirm that and send it out. Okay. Tammy, are there more questions on resiliency or waterfront? Uh, sorry, Michael Kramer is his hand up after Alice and then uh, Rosa. I don't know if you still have your hand up, but you'll go after Michael. Okay, thank you, Tammy. I'm, I'm wondering about creating hard surfaces on Governor's Island and what effect that will have on Lower Manhattan. I mean, in some respects, when you have a sandy um, Governor's Island actually absorbs some of the water and takes some of the the um, the damage away from Lower Manhattan. I'm wondering if that can be studied in some way. I know Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency has hyd hydrologists who are talking about uh, the different ways that water moves in that area. And the more hard surfaces, the more we may have to worry about it coming over to the Manhattan side. Question. 
Claire. Um, so the, our, um, we have uh, designed the park and open space to be able to handle all the runoff from um, the hard surfaces that are contemplated in this proposal. Um, so our belief is that they have been sized appropriately to not create any essentially negative impact. Um, because again, uh, for the island, the amount of hard surface is still going to be whether the amount folks would like to see is still very low in proportion to the broader acreage of the island um, and the stormwater system and the absorption in the park and open space on the North Island has always been designed to handle development in the development areas. Hopefully that helps um, answer the question. I mean, uh, I assume so because Michael's hand is down and he's not on on anymore. Rosa. Um, and I just want to say I'm speaking so much because I, I really care about this um, and I'm really, really hoping that you guys are successful in um, what you need to do to make this uh, an amazing park for us. Um, to me, the park, the park is the primary piece, right? So the development is just there to basically provide money to support the park. And ideally it would be something beyond that, even greater and would add value. But the park is, is the goal. And so when we talk about the, the subsection of waterfront access specifically, um, again, going back to that Eastern promenade and I'm sorry, but can you break that down? Like what that 55 feet is, like how wide is like say the land from the water's edge to, you know, is there any grassy areas there is now between let's say the water's edge to the, you know, the street or the road? That you're going to have and then how wide is there like is there sidewalk space separate from the road is there a seating area is there like how does that get broken down what do we have there so that we understand what that 55 feet entails and you know how scrunched up it is well I, uh, before you answer that claire i also want to tag on to where rosa went because one of the conversations that we're having here about waterfront access is to ensure that unlike Battery Park City, which you guys have well noted as a sample for an esplanade, you can't actually access the water mm -hmm. for Battery Park City to, you know, for example, you're at the marina, you can walk up to the edge, but you're fenced in. So that actually does not provide waterfront access to the level of what we're talking about. So those are the two sort of aspects, you know, where that, how wide and where it is and how much access to the water it is. Yeah. Um, so one thing I would say is that, um, you know, the reality is that the at great, great Esplanade around the island was, um, you know, basically value engineered out of the park construction, whatever that was 10 years ago. Um, um, not, not that long ago, excuse me. Um, similar to, I think, what Alice was mentioning earlier, which is the wetland portion of the project. And, um, you know, I think people had to make some tough choices and obviously prioritized um, really high impact stuff that I think we all know and love today. We don't have um, the money to do the designs for or actually implement major capital improvements to um, the remaining unbuilt portions of the park today, which include the Grand Esplanade. Um, so the zoning as contemplated is really meant to give us the room to do that stuff. And we are have in the past and are committed to and happy to um, in some way uh, to memorialize here that we will fully engage with the community around what design for future open space looks like, including water get downs, including the exact layout of the Esplanade. Because Rosa, that's part of I think what we've struggled with is that isn't designed yet. We just um, we don't have that as a capital project um, uh, today, and it will be, you know, something that we come around to in concert with these with these development sites. But is your understanding then that that 55 feet, let's say, on the eastern side, literally encompass from water's edge to the property line of the development, and so that yeah. includes both the multimodal transportation road, whatever it is, plus any green space there might be, plus any sidewalk if there is any, plus any seating area if there is any because then that versus like mm -hmm. say just 55 feet of like you know road slash sidewalk is is a completely different yeah well i think we're trying, we're trying to very very deliberately stay away from anything that could look like a, 
a sort of road that you would be tempted to drive down fast. Right, so I don't think we, um, you know, again, it hasn't been designed yet, but I think we are specifically trying to get away from the feeling of a large boulevard, which a can feel a little barren, but B can encourage people to actually, you know, it's like the wound earth thing from Europe. Uh, but, um, I, you know, we've been sort of recommended by our urban design team that 55 feet is sort of the right length to accommodate those uses without creating those negative impacts. But again, I know that this has been like something that's come up. Um, and so, you know, we're again, happy to work with folks on that. If, if the community board wants to recommend a widening of that, um, it, it would make sense to put in here. Um, oh, Tammy, you're on I, mute. I think we want to, I think widening and access, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really, I still don't want to see a large wide fenced in area when we're talking about contextual access to the water. You know, it's bizarre to me um, and has been pointed out to me by uh, several people. I think Alice quoted it well by saying, and I think Graham Birchall, um, for, we are one of the largest islands and yet one of the least accessible to the waters around us. And we don't want to make the same mistake on Governor's Island that was made in New York by rip wrapping a even a beautiful esplanade and the you know vehicular route or trolley route around the edge of the island without allowing people to you know have access to the water. Okay. All right. All right, keep going. Yay, 927. Let's go. Everybody wake back up because it's about to get good. We're moving on height and scale of development. It's It's been a main event topic since the beginning. Um, there's some generalized comments here. And if people want to see um, very specific parameters mentioned, that's something we'll have to discuss. Uh, I'm just going to go through everything in this section because there are some subsections. Proposed height, density, and scale of development is inappropriate. Height and density of the proposal must be reduced in order to be more appropriate for the island, allow for the better pu public access and use of the island, and to be more consistent with earlier iterations of the plan. The community has called for more specific urban design and architectural guidelines for the for development of the South Island. The maximum heights of the development parcels range from 200 to 300 feet with permitted obstructions for rooftop mechanicals allowed up to 60 feet on the top of the eastern side and 40 on the western side. And as a reference, currently on the island, the tallest buildings are, are Liggett Hall, approximately four and a half stories. And um, that, that big mechanical vent structure, 126 feet. As a subsection, inconsistency with prior plans, though earlier iterations of the plan for South Island development, like the 2010 master plan and 2013 FGSEIS, have been out, uh, outlined by the trust as merely conceptual, the public's understanding for the plan was based on those earlier models and the drastic increase. The scale of development is unacceptable. The issue of base plan, which is where it built measured from its its definition well it's undefined currently in the zoning in a way that um, it makes it definable by developers which is a big concern to the community the base plane is not defined in the proposed zoning text given the unique conditions on the island and in the absence of streets and curbs from where it is usually defined base plane should be more clearly defined in the zoning text with specific height parameters George specifically recommended where the development zones meet the open space. Tammy, I know you may have issue with that, so that's something we'll need to address. The transition zone area that's intended to be a transition zone is narrow and in fact in sharp contrast to the North Historic District. The Governor's Island Historic District Design and Development Guidelines state that development in the transition zone should be neither diminutive or nor overwhelming in scale should recognize the appropriate setbacks and pedestrian qualities of division road and should maintain the character of the historic buildings to the north the transition zone should begin at the heights of the neighboring historic district and abandoning the village scale of the north island alters the existing character of the historic district 
Public views, the scale of development is extreme and would compromise public views, one of the most treasured resources on the island. And finally, and similarly shadows, the heights and scale of development proposed would cause dramatic negative impact from shadows, specifically for the North Island, i.e. the Harbor School. Okay, do you have, um, there were a couple slides that were about height and scale images. Do you have those, Diana? Yeah, let me pull up a couple of things. I have the um, November 9th presentation, and I also have Alice specifically sent, sent me a few. So let me pull up both here. Perfect. Okay, let's see. This is the slide uh, referencing the, the maximum heights on each development parcel. This does not include that that 40 and 60 foot uh, allowance on the top for mechanicals. These are some uh, images and, that Alice and it doesn't Diana. It also does include the extra FAR bonus and upscaling for zoning for coastal resilience. That's correct. Yeah. It, zoning for coastal flood resiliency would would out a, a, a varying benefit of up to 10 feet on height. I just also want to point out, Diana, while you have the slide up, um, I know you'll be talking about the transitional zone. I just, you know, that zone between just to identify that the North Island versus the South Island is really very clearly delineated in terms of scale on that slide. Anyway, oh, there it is again in, in section. Right, where you're seeing the right, the North Island on the right and the South Island on, on the left, and you see it in plan on the other. I think I'm not sure if people had seen these slides. Some of them were were in the in EIS, and so I think it's important that we all, you know, have access to that. These are these are comparisons. The no action with action comparison from the DEIS. This is view north from the eastern development zone. This is rendering of the view from the great promenade. Oof. This is a view east from the oval. Rendering of the view south from Avenue. Uh, okay. That's it. Okay, so this is folks where. We are opining, we have heard numerous things on this, and this is a place where I hope to hear from more than just the 3 or 4 of us who have been. Opining, so pop a hand up. Let's get a sense of where we're going. <laughs> Uh, Susan Cole. What would you like to hear? That it is totally out of context. It is awful looking. It's blocked. It's just, it, it, it has no, it's really very sad. I don't know what else to say, Tammy. Um, well, uh, it's well, just, it, it, it's, the, it, it's the wrong concept and it's what we've talked about all night long. Um, I think it's a so, but right, but we need to put some specific stuff in here, right? There's a no vote to anything. There's a no unless, and there's a yes with changes. Well, so unless either either way, we've got to get to some point. You know, we can say anything to try and you know, it just has to. We just have to have a vote. Um, so the questions. These are the things that we've heard. People looking at. You know, it, no one knows where, you know, the parcel range maximum heights came. The original conversations were more village scale than urban scale. So we've got to, you know, come in. Diana can show you the inconsistency with prior plans and we just need to, we're on record already saying that this was not much development, but we've got to go on record again with the zoning. So, Diana, can you pull up the inconsistency with priors? 
be talking about this section here, the 2010 master plan, yep. 2013 F. Let's see. Yep, yep, yep. Give me a second to find those specifics. That's okay. All right. So I hear where you're at, Susan, but I we have to like put right, something in here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And Laura, you have not spoken much. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, uh, what do I have to say about this? Well, I mean, to Susan's point, you know, if we turned this whole thing down, they would still be adding buildings here. So it's not like we're, you know, going to make a vote and the result would be just a pure park. So right. I still, I still would really like to see a massing comparison of the 2013 volumes to this um, to just get a sense. I mean, I know this is three times bigger, but it would be helpful to see um, a real comparison of that visually, which we haven't seen. And then, you know, I, I know that the historic buildings are wonderful, but really the the repair and ongoing maintenance of those buildings that are so hard to inhabit is driving a lot of this in a way it's like we're sacrificing the like we're we're urbanizing these two other areas in order to help fund the historic buildings that we have no idea. Um, so what's the ask? What is the ask? Well, I would l like to see this comparison, this volume comparison of the of the 2013 and, you know, with this. Is that is that an okay ask in this context? Yeah, I'm going to jump in. I, I found this section with details, um, the numbers here. I'm just going to read it quickly. I, I have the numbers. I don't have a visual comparison on hand no i know but diana we we have the numbers we've had the numbers it's not the issue it's the oh vision. no I, I understand i just pulled it up because tammy specifically asked for it but i totally understand what you're saying and that there's a desire for that side-by-side -side comparison you're talking about drawings and elements and yeah i'm talking yeah, about that, like that has not that has not been provided because we the 2013 plan as presented was not deemed viable. I know, but that's still our baseline. If we were to turn this down completely, that's what where we would be. So right? that's a comment. Then that's a comment to go in here that for the zoning is that it we'd like to revert to no i would in order to really understand this better i would like to see a visual look look if we were to turn this down it would be this 2013 these 2013 volumes but i understand what the trust is saying which is those are un they they can't inhabit they they've been unsuccessful in their rfps to get somebody to uh, to to go for that right it's it's like not enough to attract nyu or columbia or whatever right so they're saying mm -hmm. they need, so they're saying they need more to attract somebody but i don't like i don't understand there's there's two different metrics here one is like what's is is there some kind of magic number of what would attract a, this this anchor tenant right and then the next thing is what do they need to keep this whole thing going with all the infrastructure and the their, their answer is, their answer is what they is what we were given um tammy can i just interject one point of fact here um yep. if you if it were to be turned down te technically what would happen is that um the existing r32 zoning would uh, remain in place which is a residential zoning um, allowing uh, an excess of 3 million square feet. Um, that wouldn't help in any way because it has all these other height restrictions and you really need just, it doesn't make any sense. It, it never makes, 
it was never changed or thought about because when the Coast Guard and Army were here, they didn't have to look at existing zoning. So technically what would happen is if this rezoning process failed, that's the zoning that would remain in place. And, it, you know, the park has FAR and you can develop on it and all that stuff. Um, Laura, to your question, our, our belief about the bare minimum of FAR we would need on the South Island to hit that financial number is 3.75. So about 500% less. Do you have a sense of the magic number you would need to attract this kind of magical anchor tenant? That's my question. Yeah, we've this um, sort of goes back to the point Chris made earlier about having studied different districts like this around the country. They do range in size, um, but the median is about 4 million square feet overall. Um, but they range think- from they range up to 8 million. They range down to two and a half. Um, so I, you know, it's hard to really put a pin on that um, um, in a way that we would feel. Because I, also you know. keep in mind, this is, I mean, this is an island, but it's not like in the middle of nowhere. It's like a very short yeah. ferry right away from, you know, the the most, you know, vibrant urban center in the world. So it's, you know, what I'm saying. It's not like Governor's it's Island. It's it's hard to find a perfect comp, but we 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 did try to be cognizant of of that. It's not like you're in a wheat field in the middle of nowhere, right? Um, so you're sort of arms link the, from a city. It would be helpful okay. to see the comps. I you know I would like to see the comps, and the other the one other thing is I would like to see um, ground floor floor uses that really support a day in the park. Like I think that it's you know right now um i view the park as a little bit under supported in terms of amenities and if we're going to have buildings i think that that the ground floor should you know have well like i just said the restaurant like things that that prolong a person's stay in the park and make for a better like day in the park or you know a longer day in the park or or whatever Okay. All right. Laura. Mm. We still have to opine directly, no matter if we want to see the modeling or not, we have to do a resolution. We can put that under public engagement. Community board one does not feel there's been strong enough engagement to show comps or alternate, uh, you know, lower height development. We can definitely put that in public engagement, but is there anything that you want to say about the heights in terms of scope and scale that does not that we. Yes, I mean, I, I don't know, like, I think it's it's way too tall. I think it's basically putting the height of a lot of the financial district over there. It's just it's urbanizing it as opposed to making it into some kind of village and for for an area that's for a center that's for climate change. I mean, I just. Yes. I just Okay, gotcha. All right, Uh, Susan, I think you spoke. Andrew, we're going to go to you and then I'll come back. No, I want to say one more thing, Tammy, if I just may. Uh, I just think we we should put in something. Look at where we are financially, physically today. There's something very short sighted, Claire, in where we are and where we're going to be. You're not going to get some of this stuff now. And I don't know how to phrase it, Tammy, but we're we're not looking at it properly. I think Laura's uh, issue about lowering the scope, but there's something here. NYU and all of those are not coming here right now. And we'll be lucky if they even come here in three to five years. And somehow we have to put that in in our proposal. That's all I want to say. Okay. Uh, so we can turn that around about fiscal concerns exist in a post pandemic New York City with you know severe budget issues that would not encourage academic development. Right. So, so, so then to my point earlier when this was first presented a month or two ago is that if if you don't get that sort of tenant, then it's like a perfect situation for an Amazon because there's no residential neighborhood there to protest it. 
It's like basically you're saying this is like the perfect corporate yes. headquarters. Yes. Yeah, that's, okay, that, Andrew. That I think would be really that that would that would be really bad. Like I think we have to say something against that. Yeah. That was gonna be my question. Thank you for uh, Fern. Yeah. Is that you? Yeah, I, I, I'm off mute finally. In all of this, the one thing that I it just everything assumes that there's gonna be this particular type of of tenant, if you will. And but what if that doesn't happen? And I'm glad Susan um brought that up because that's exactly it's like, okay, so what happens if there isn't? Uh, an educational facility. There's just no guarantee that that's going to happen, as far as I know. Correct. So, how do we do? We go back to square one. <laughs> no, yeah. then they under the current zoning they would be able to go to anybody. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be an academic. Right. Well, that's yeah, that's what we're worried about. <laughs> Right, that's what we keep talking about. Like it's a done deal that it's an academic, but it, it does. If 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 that's if it, if that's not required, then it could be anything. Do not know if zoning is the appropriate mechanism for control on that. Well, I think that's one reason it's being rezoned, actually. Yeah, you're right. The Amazon, you know, de Blasio and Cuomo's Amazon deal fell through. And now, you know, like, this is a way to kind of recapture that with, with Governor's Island, because, like I said, there's no local community right there to to just say no. I mean, we're it, basically. Why? I agree with Laura. Here's Vicki Cameron so, agreeing with her um, after all these years of work. So, Tammy, we need to take this seriously. So what is the suggestion that you need to put in? We have to get mo moving to a position of, you know, getting to a vote. So what are we saying? No. I think we're saying that Governor's Island is this is a place of of culture it, and culture and education and open space, you know, I consider open space part of culture, quite frankly, you know, it's not, it, it, it's not like we're creating this like pure wilderness there, right? It's, it's a very like urbanized culture park, I think, or, or it's an urban park setting. And, you know, like Central Park has the Met and it's got um, the Museum of Natural History across the street, et cetera. You know, that's those should be the sort of uses that dominate this if we have to have buildings. That's okay. Supporting uses for that and, and it shouldn't just become another look look at all the real estate that's gonna be vacant in the financial district for so long. I mean, look at all the people like uh, how are you how do you want that to be reflected in a resolution? That is the most important. Well, Governor's Island is is a cultural destination for the city. It's a it's an open space and cultural destination, and that the and at open space cultural and education, and that the the anchoring um, occupants or whatever tenants of those buildings, sponsors of whatever you call the spot. Sorry, it's late. Sponsors of those buildings. You know, should be along those lines. Tammy, can I ask a question which might help perhaps? Uh, sure. Add yeah. some clear. And I guess this is a question for Claire and team. And I don't know if you can answer this, but you've mentioned the rezoning footprint generally encompasses 33 acres. And you've spoken about both. Uh, Floor area of 4.2 million or thereabouts 4.5 million square feet or building height of 305 square feet. If you had to choose one as being more important, would you rather have your 4.2 or 4.5 square feet or would you rather have building height? It's not my, it's not my choice. This is a conversation 
I'm asking that of, of the trust. If they had to, it might give us some guidance as to where there's room to to, to work or compromise. Claire, if you had to pick between building height or total square footage, could you prioritize one versus the other? Um, oh, that's Andrew. This good one. Um, I, you know, I think probably we would feel most comfortable making changes in both and having those be sort of and reflect each other and be in balance. Um, but if I really had to choose one, I guess I would choose square footage. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, you know, we've tried to create really limited opportunities for height across the district. I think that's something we could continue to hear, you know, feedback on and 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 winnow down to be even more precise. But I think for certain uses, um, which are some of the uses that we care about for income generation, like hotel and even potentially dorm, um, you know, that a little bit of height goes a long way. Um, and, from views and things, but yeah, I think you know ultimately the square footage is the opportunity. So, so Chris, the, if it's R, what is it existing right now? R three two, correct. Right, and so isn't that a thirty five foot height limit? It's up to sixty feet for um, community facility. So really no more than a six story building. Mm -hmm. Correct. Part of it is that we've moved all of the density from the central open space um, into the development zones. Okay, uh, but if you're talking six stories versus 30 or 40 stories, you know. We're not, we're not talking that, I mean, that's not, I, I don't, I, I don't want to, um, I didn't mean to leave that impression. I think, you know, back, coming back to Andrew's question, um, Andrew, of course, we understand that there'll be recommendations in both. And I do think they work together, right? Like, um, in the sense that, as Chris said, there's certain discrete areas for height um, and um, for depending on the use group, different building forms are necessary. Right. Yeah, I guess I, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking 30 floors or 40 floors, whatever the, the 305 feet amount to yeah. versus six stories or 35 feet. I guess I was thinking more 300 feet and, you know, 200 buildings of that, uh, sorry, two buildings of that height versus 200 feet and three buildings of that height or, yeah. or just some way, because I would have thought square footage was most important. Yeah. And I hear Chris's comment about hotels. I mean, look, I, I get that, but I've stayed at hotels where there have been two towers anchored around a, a two-story, you know, right. center and area. And you're ultimately, Claire, Claire answered this question earlier, but based off the that the financial modeling we've done, we really do have a lower limit in square footage, and there is some, you know, which is around the the three. Three million seven hundred fifty thousand that that Claire mentioned already. So like that that really is the bottom line in terms of square footage and a, and a trade off that we feel like we can live with and live with fiscally, with our goals of, of reaching financial financial self sufficiency. But of course, you know, on, on the on the margins, it's hard to really measure this. But some of that value that would help support the park and all the other things we're looking to get come from, um, you know, some of the limited opportunities for height too. Yeah, and, and Tammy, the, just the last, I guess, comment I want to share, and I, I, it's a it's a valid point to raise. You know, in this environment, what can we attract, or what can the trust attract? And and right now, academia might be difficult. I don't know if this will give people comfort or not, but. All we have to look at is Hudson River Park Trust and the two RFPs they've issued for redesigning Pier 40. Once they selected a design and brought it to the community for review and input, if it didn't deliver sufficient community benefit in exchange for that commercial project, the community was able to successfully kill both of those projects. So I think there's an inherent governance model that works here that if but we don't have that, Andrew. We I don't, don't have think what? we I don't think we have that model here. Oh, for we review. Ask for it. Can we ask we, for it? 
Oh, well, I would think we have the model of the, the trust coming to us to present a design around a successful RFP and asking for community feedback. I mean, I'd be surprised if we didn't have that. I, I don't think that's a legislative process with Hudson River Park and CB2. That's a really good point, actually. We should put that in there. I agree. I agree. Yes. There is a small tweak that we noticed in the zoning that that uh, Diana and George can review as well, because there was a removal of community board purview for within this zoning. I remember that. I'm, I'm going to jump to a different one. section. That's I'm going to jump. Problem. I'm going to jump to that section since it's come up um, and it's not a removal, but it is a slight change and and the preference seems to be the, oh the original condition. Um, I'm going to pass this is a long section, so I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but essentially there's a provision written to, into the North Island rezoning during the last rezoning that allows the community board to review any the establishment of a commercial use at or above 7500 square feet. Um, it's been amended in this current proposal to state that at the time that um, a DOB permit is sought for a commercial use at or above 7,500 square feet, and um, it, that has a, a big potential to reduce the number of th those types of reviews that come before the community board because there are, there are uh, various instances in which a new commercial use might be established but doesn't require. DOB permit. So in that particular instance, we we are requesting that the original language is preserved for the North Island zoning. But again, I don't I don't want to speak for the trust, but I'd be really surprised if the trust didn't anticipate incredibly aggressive, strong vocal community pushback if with community input on an RFP design meant to call for submissions around academia, well, anchored around academia and a climate center. And instead, their board, which includes a CB1 representative who has a vote, at least one vote, ultimately agreed to allow Amazon to put a fulfillment center on the island. I think they would anticipate pretty strong community pushback to the point of trying to kill it in its tracks. Yeah, but Andrew, the point is that we wouldn't get to review it until it's going to the Department of Buildings, which is really like a fait accompli at that point. Do you know how much money would have been spent on the design and negotiations by then? That's way yeah, I, I, I do, and that I do, and that's why specifically Hudson River Park Trust created the task force with the electeds to prevent having to go through a third RFP process without having some type of guidance from the community as to what it would accept. And that was memorialized in a resolution along the lines of what Tammy's trying to do here. And it did discuss things like height and square footage. Uh, and well it, it provided, said. I'm sorry? Well said, thank you. Well, I, I it might've been well said, but I'm saying it somewhat from the standpoint of, I'm hoping as we saw with CB2 and HRPT, we find a way to make this uh, subject, yes, yeah, subject to conditions. Yes, but what I'm saying is if the condition is that we only review it, I know you're saying that we'll have enough people implanted in the process throughout, but I think there should be a community board review well before the DOB phase of this. Is that something that we want to add into the zoning? Is it appropriate to be listed in the zoning for the RFP? Think about what we're asking because we need to get through this and I want to call for a question within the next 20 minutes. Yes. I'm gonna call, all right, Patrick. I could just quickly to echo what Andrew was saying. Not only um, are there, I guess, the, the community board has a seat at the trust board table, but in the, scenario of an Amazon type of thing, forget logistical implausibility of something like that, but um, the um, board is also made up of representatives of the state senator and of the assembly member who you, you can bet would be pretty vocal and most times the council member as well would be pretty vocal on those issues. So it's not 
as though there's some cabal that could sort of make that go through just because it's on the whim of the mayor or the governor. That's the only point I wanted to make. Thanks. But well, that's not my point, Patrick. I mean, the the way that the assembly people and the other elected officials who are on the the board or on the committee know what to, know what to say. They're rep, they're our representatives, and they can't represent us if we don't know what's going on and we're not reviewing it and opining on it. Like I think, I think I think they would. That's the whole tandem of of the relationship, as well as the community boards leadership on the community advisory council. I don't think anything like that could slip through the cracks and the community board wouldn't know about it. But I hear the point about wanting uh, Patrick a specific review. Right, Susan, tell him. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. Patrick. You're too kind. Uh, well, anyway, I, I, hang on, I have the floor, if I may. I just yeah, I'm sorry. Point, um, that I, I, I don't think anything like that would, would slip through the cracks. And I think as well, if, if there's, there are so many mechanisms that can be built in where the community board can have a voice and, and certainly does. Okay. So I've got Bob, you've got a hand up if it's productive. Vicki, Andrew, were you done? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. And uh, okay. I think that uh, your concerns would need to be noted in the resolution that we do have concerns. We will note the concerns in the resolution and request a similar thing as, you know, similar ways for the community board to opine. Okay, Bob, did you have anything specific? Well, I hope it's a little productive. I I think that this for just this point of view seems important to me, and that is that the most important thing is that the uh, project for Governor's Island be a successful one, and successful for Governor's Island and for the public. From my point of view, there's a pr promise of a model eco center, education center, energy center, and sustainability center. Maybe we can require that somehow or another. Uh, in uh, talking about this, but this require this is from the beginning of the discussion required a partner, and so the question is not what I would prefer, or what we would prefer, but what does the anchor partner need if there is such a partner? And Claire made a reference to there being an anchor partner that that she was aware of some of them. They wouldn't put this forward if that were true. The really important grounding for this is that there. Are be an anchor partner that can create the model centers. Is there, are there, is that really a viable concept at this point? And how do we go forward to do that? The only experience I have like this is Cornell Tech, where there actually are some eco buildings, that, and it is really in some ways a model. So my question to Claire is, is are we fantasizing here about anchor tenants and actually achieving a model eco center and a model education center here? Um, it's our belief, having talked um, to many universities and having done quite a bit of research over the past months and I guess over a year now, um, that it's not a fantasy and that um, we believe this project will be successful. Um, you know, I would also say, uh, you know, as we said before, we do need to. Um, go about this project via a future solicitation. Um, but yes, we um, we think there's going to be ample interest in this project, both, um, you know, really across the country. Okay. So I want so, this, Bob, whatever resolution, that, whatever resolution that we make here, I just want to make sure it doesn't foreclose the possibility of that anchored partner. So uh, am I on? Yes, Joe. When we talk about anchors, we're talking about an old way of doing business. Anchors were Macy's, Sears, and they're not going to be anymore. So I, I'd, li I'd like to know what they think an anchor tenant is, because it certainly isn't what it used to be. And whenever you use the word anchor tenant, you're talking about a developer. They Developers had to get an anchor tenant before they can start any more they wanted. Yep. I mean, uh, there's also, I mean, one of the things that we haven't really even talked about is that there already is a climate education 
you know, and there already is composting on the island. There are ready uses on the island that we want to make sure get preserved and that the anchor tenants who are there have an opportunity to remain and that they're not tossed out. So you don't have a situation that you have a community like the Harbor School, like Earth Matters, like some of the other, you know, people who are there helping to build the constituency for the island, then to be pushed out and replaced due to the anchor. Well, this also goes back to what Richard said, I don't know how many hours ago, what if we did nothing? And what would that cost? More than we can afford. Because uh, the island the island cannot be cannot afford to stay as nothing because the city will not continue to fund it ad finitum. Well, by nothing I mean we don't look for an anchor tenant. There are other people who would who would go there without an anchor tenant because there's so much traffic of people. People make a uh, 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 development for business. Gotcha. That's right, Joe, and we support, we pay. Tammy, why do we need to worry about this? We pay for everything in New York City. If we want to park, we have to pay a park. Why is this fear mongering driving this process? All right, let's keep going. I hear you, but we're in we're we're on the home run. Let's keep going. We've got we've got our height issues. We've got our density issues. In, inconsistency with the prior plans. Base plane. I'm gonna. Base plane is a major conversation here because with the new zoning for coastal flood resiliency, it relies on base plane, which is not set, and therefore left up to the anchor tenant or developers. So where we want to go on this is to base plane for those who are not um, clearly understanding will allow based on the current proposed zoning and who knows if that'll end up being final. You know, it could be 10 feet or up to 10% bonus based on building flood resistance um i i think you're cr crossing to tammy the base plane i may be i need more coffee. I, Go for I, it. Totally I, I think the two, so zoning for coastal flood resiliency and the text for governor's island are are just melting together at this point yep. but the issue, the issue of base plane is inherently part of the governor's island text um, base plane is typically measured by uh, streets and curbs of which there are, aren't any on governor's island as defined by the zoning um, so that means it's it's left open to to infill or or um, a raising and such, which could um, you know ch change the the heights as we understand them. It's another one of those unpredictable factors, um, and I think the fact of the matter is that base plane needs to be more clearly defined or or defined period as part of this zoning. And like I said, uh, one of George's particular recommendations was where the development zones meet the open space. Tammy, I know you had concerns on on uh, specifically on one side of the development zones and that that may be too high. So if we can hone in on on um, if if there are specifics that people want to see there, let's get into that a little bit. You know, I don't know if you have it, but can do you have the slide from the Governor's Island presentation that showed the elevations? Because my concern was, of course, that the elevation that would be used for the developers were part of the hills instead of, you know, which is significantly higher than the front. Because if I was a developer. Governor's I, Island, does anybody from the Governor's Island team have an idea of where I might find that in, in the 11.9 presentation? Um, the one that showed the heights. Well, Amy, I'm going to. I think, sorry, I think that was in the. I think that might have been in the slides. Did we show slides at the on the when we had the discussion about Zik first specifically? I'm not sure that that was in the. <clears throat> I George, I'm sure that yeah, I just wanted to say they're not going to be able to, for, to use the hills for the development sites because they're separated by the connections, right? The issue really is is that the the elevation of the development sites can be raised. I mean, you, you could very reasonably see them leveled, 
right? So that the lower areas come up higher, but there is no limitation on raising them. They can be raised over the open space, um, which I think, you know, ultimately when you raise the site, you raise the height. And I think that's the, the major issue. So do we have recommendations on base plane that are not going to include the fact that if you've got a three, whatever the height of the building is, whether it's um, 120 feet or 300 feet or whatever the height is, that there's not an additional 25 feet put on there from base plane assumptions at 15 and 10 feet from um, zoning for coastal flood resiliency. But Tammy and people, don't we know what the design flood elevation is? Why can't it just start from there? It's probably like elevation 15 or something, 15, 19, I don't know. According to when we had a presentation from city planning, they base everything off of the base plane. And there is no base plane on governors because there are no maps. Well, I traits. understand that, but what I'm saying is logically, the the point of it is to get the to the, the point of it is is that the ground floor is either unusable or it's really expensive to build to be usable because if, if it's a grade because it's in the floodplain. To get it above the floodplain, FEMA has maps showing what the design flood elevation is. So it's probably somewhere, I don't know, maybe fifteen or between fifteen and nineteen here. The Chris, do you is, know? Um, so, could I, oh. Yeah, so if I may jump in here. So you could raise this over, the elevation can be just raised to whatever height you want, right? And and, and it may be raised to over the, the, um, uh, the design flood elevation. Um, and the point is, is, is that, is that you could have a building with you know, flood resistant uh, construction that has no danger of flooding because this is all one zoning lot, right? So it all applies here. The, it's a, all a 1% zone. Even the hills are a 1% zone. Um, and so, you know, my, my, my recommendation was fairly simple. It was like, you don't want the development sites to be over the open space. You don't want them looming over the open space. And so, you have elevations for where the um, where the development sites meet the open space, and you pick the highest one, and you say you just can't have a base plane over that, um, and that keeps the the development at or below the height of the open space. Laura, Bob. I, I don't know. Um, In a similar vein, would you consider basically pinning it at the top? So basically, rather than saying from wherever the base plane may be and could float to, especially with regards to the coastal resiliency text, why don't you say, okay, so you said you wanted to go no higher than the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is built. It already exists. We know where the maximum height of it is. It's at 305 feet, right? So take that line straight across and then That's say, okay, no building that you build is able to go with any portion of it, whether it be a permitted obstruction or, or not, nothing is going to go over this specific height. Or you can pin it at that height and say, nothing will go over, let's say 50 feet under that height right so rather than the the bottom can float and they can divide their floor to floor however they want to right to get the square footage that they want to get into any specific building but the height is set by an already existing structure which would be the statue of liberty and we say you can't go anywhere beyond that right well you can set Ro that rosie here's my question on that yes yeah. the original concept was you know, conversations where village scale, you know, the height of let's, let's say Liggett, right? right? And that's significantly lower than the Statue of Liberty. Not sure how we got to the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, I, you it know. was mentioned at one of the prior meetings. So just yes, like in my but, 
Yeah, but I'm not absolutely. That- but is that something? Is that something that I, I hear where you're going, and I like where you're going because for the base plane and everything else that goes with it, that's a perfect way to do it. Then the question becomes where we started this: What's the maximum height that people feel is contextually appropriate for the island? No more than what we already have, Tammy. Which is but the top of Liggett. Exactly. Thank you. Okay, Diana. I think I think I actually I think that. okay. Um, and I don't, well. So my one question before I can not agree with that is what is the um, yeah. what is the floor to floor that you are imagining in these um, shapes that are filling up the zoning envelope to get you to the four point two seven five whatever zoning square foot. Um, thanks, Rosa. Um, Chris, again, fact check me, but I think for the sort of pseudo residential uses like dorm, um, we typically look at, you know, 10 to 12 um, for commercial type uses, they're higher, 14 to 16. And then for uses like cultural or um, um, R&D, they could, they could be higher, you know. You know, you can imagine a grand cultural space where there's 30 foot ceilings, but um, that's a little bit. I think um, I don't want to lead us down a weird rabbit hole right, with right, that. Right. Yeah, yeah, that wouldn't take up that much square foot, anyways. Um, in considering the overall package, because to me, like for, as you said, dorms. I mean, the kids don't get to choose. You know, the most luxurious thing in the world. They can live with a 10 foot floor to floor. They could theoretically live with a nine foot floor to floor, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's not. It doesn't have to be luxury. Um, I think it's mainly I, about the building systems that you yeah, look to. Yeah. Um, okay. Is going to end up being more. You're right. Like it's not about oh how high are my ceilings. It's just about yes. what you're trying to get in between. You get yeah. Yeah. You you can so do it. In we time. we just have to get to a point that we put something here. That's that's okay. really where I'm at. Okay. Um, I do have points specific to the zoning text and the resolution. So I guess the reason hit why it quick about, hit it quickly. Okay. So we because um, there's two other hands up. Maximum uh, the street wall height on the park side. To me, it is too high. It's backwards. Um, it should be lower because it's overwhelming and the uh, setback from that maximum st- the street wall is very shallow. And so it's. And then if you're able to actually go up to a height of 300 feet, which we don't know, we haven't determined yet, um, it's just it's just overwhelming um, on the park side as a park user. Um, point two, lot E4, I think that needs to be shaved back. And the reason why is because Picnic Point or, you know, what was a, before noted as the prow, I think, is an incredible end point. It's an end tip of the um, southern edge of the island and it has incredible views and then to sort of bisect it with the development i think is a little the development doesn't lose anything by it still has its amazing views higher up but for somebody enjoying the park i think that that the completion of that tip is actually really important and it's a very special spot um in terms of the maximum building height i agree it is too high and by the maximum building height, I'm talking about everything all in, including the permitted obstructions at 360 feet or, you know, with coastal resiliency and whatever else higher than that is too high. To me, we need to be talking about something much lower and by much lower in my mind, I'm thinking more in the range of 250 at an absolute max. Um, the other thing I would say is that the, um, sorry, I'm trying to cover way too much, uh, very quickly. The, um, the separation between the historical portion on the north side and the southern portion, especially as you noted at Yankee Pier, um, I think mm-hmm. that needs to be increased um, so that you do have a separation between what's modern or what's, you know, the new part and what is the historical old part and they can have the space to sort of let each other breathe. So the problem that you have with that is that's the transition zone, which which is very narrow. And yes, I agree that should be wider, but that also goes into the notes that we've said that it should also start at the same 
contextual height as what's in the historic zone. It is, but then after the setback is when it goes shoots crazy high, and that's the problem that we have, right? It does. You see that the base, the minimum or max, is it supposed to be minimum? It says minimum, but I'm assuming that's supposed to actually be maximum, is thirty nope. feet. No. Nope. Yes. What's what's nope. the maximum base height there? What's the street wall? Uh, maximum base height, I believe, was nine stories. Uh, yeah, uh, Yankee Pier Plaza, um, DCP really wanted to make sure there was a street wall. So there's a minimum of 30 and a maximum of 90. Oh, yeah, we, I don't think we agree with that. Yep. Um, as, as you can hear. And then, oh, and the last thing yes, I wanted to make was I, I'm, I'm in probably disagreement with most people here in that I think that the height to me is I would rather see taller, skinnier buildings that allow you to have views past the buildings than I would prefer to see long, shallow buildings that take up as much land as possible. To me, you want to maintain the openness of the park space and have as much park space as possible. And if that means that, you know, sort of as, you know, Andrew mentioned, you know, do you want gross square footage or do you want height? Well, I want park space. I want as much park space as we can get. And so if that means that there's a trade-off to allow a little bit more height, then I would do that. To me, that deal is worth it. But you know, other people will disagree with me. So, but that's my personal perspective on it. Um, and then the last thing is, if you guys ever could give up the Western kidney bean, that would make it so much better to have the rest of the parkland feels like it is on, on an island and not in a canyon between you know 300 foot tall buildings i think that that it, that western kidney bean just sort of makes it compressed you can see it on the on the site plan right now and you saw it in the renderings that you presented it just it compresses things i think in a way that makes it a little too New York City and not enough Governor's Island. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Done. Okay. You're Rosa, you're done. <laughs> Andrew. Yeah, sorry. I, I will try not to take too long, but just to supplement what Rosa said. I, I, I'm not on this call and I haven't spent the time and energy on this because I have any interest in buildings on Governor's Island. The reason I'm on this call and committing energy is that I think Governor's Island in its current form underserves our community. I think there's a lot of untapped potential. And if to realize that potential, we might have to consider revenues coming from commercial projects as the means to achieve that goal. That, that's why I'm on this call. And I'd love to see assets like a Pier 26 that was recently built out. I'd love to see that type of design and function incorporated onto Governor's Island. So with that backdrop and trying to find ways to make this work, I think I've heard from the Governor's Island team that their minimum is 3.7 million square feet. If you take that number as a percentage of what the original plan called for, I don't recall what it was, four point something million, and you determine the percentage decline, can you apply that percentage decline to the building height as well so that it's proportional? Reduction of square footage and comparable reduction of height. I don't know how the math works out. I, I, I haven't done it, but. And I, I would just echo, I would agree with Rosa. And again, we may be in the minority, I'd rather see fewer taller buildings than a campus-like structure that takes up more land. You're in a majority, you're not a minority. Okay. All right. Andrew, that was a question I need you to define a little better for Diana to put down about the original footage. Well, I don't I don't have all that. Uh, it's, I'm sure it's in this in here somewhere. But if if the original last was 4.25 million and I heard correctly and maybe I didn't, but if I heard correctly, that 3.7 was their minimum. If we drop from 4.25, 3.7 million and apply that same percentage reduction to building height, 
you're you're keeping it somewhat proportional, if you will. Someone has to do the math. I just don't. I, I haven't done it. Right. Gotcha. Understand. All right, Diana. What else do we have on this list? Please tell me. We are close to the end. I'm trying to do the math. Oh, 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 I just need to clarify here. Are, are we, is the majority that the preference is to see taller, skinnier buildings in order to provide, in order to preserve light and air and, and all of that? It seems to be a popular perspective. But nobody wants to see four, 400 or 300 foot buildings. So, you know, pursuant to Rosa, you know, the question is, a little convo is a little I, odd. Can I just chime in there, Tammy, that I think that the I think the community has spoken a lot about this, not just this board and, and the members, um, that simply there is great concern about the scale um, and the character of some of the, and the urban design of some of this. And I don't know that we're in a position tonight at uh, 1026 to turn ourselves into urban planners and architects and be able to identify precisely what would be the right approach. I think what we're trying to assist with here is to, to simply state that it's not the way it is now seems, you know, not to be getting the support that it might need, uh, you know, and, and you've identified that in, in quite a few spots here. So, I, you know, I, I just don't know if our time is well spent deciding whether it should be a tall, skinny building or yeah. Sure. Oh, uh, Alice, I, 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 couldn't, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, we're yes. we're saying Just that we want it reduced. Ourselves. We're saying that we want to reduce if we want to take it down to the 3.7 million and apply that reduction in an individualized way. I, I, I mean, I think you're right in that. I'm not right. sure we, we need to get more specific yeah. on that, especially we're asking if for reduced density. And we've asked for, um, you know, a, a control, you know, an understanding that the character of the North Island is not. Uh, you know, compromised, as I recall, is somewhere in here. These are, you know, whether, you know, whether it's a tall tower, this, you okay. know, it's, it's, it's not there. I agree with you, Alice, Vicki Cameron, please put it in. The okay, room. so let's then let's move forward on those ideas. We've got our notes about uh, this plane. We're going to talk about overall height. So, and that will be related transition zone, public views, shadows, street wall. This, the shape is, yeah, of this, is, this is for us uh, some of Rose's points here. Um, yep. we'll we'll flush okay. that out. All right. Uh, I'm okay. Gonna move it. Financial. Ahead. We already did. Uh, we have a, a couple of new ones. Financial considerations. Okay. CPC authorizations. There was concern that um, it, for a model and a zoning proposal that's already so flexible, there's concern over. The city planning commission authorizations that are available to further change the already flexible zoning and that the CV1 wishes to have a, a voice in any waivers, allowances or additional changes to the zoning. And, and 1 proposal here is to change city planning commission authorizations as proposed should be changed to CPC certifications for non permitted uses bulk and street connections, which would give the CB a more formalized role in review. And the opportunity to comment. I don't think there's there's kind of any doubt on that. Let's just keep going. Um, we already addressed this North Island community board review portion for commercial uses at or above 7,500 square feet. I think we already referenced this um, for the Harbor School in in um, supporting their expansion, the pool, et cetera. Um, and also specifically other tenants like um, earth matters and the composting uses for South Island tenants who wanted to remain for the trust to work with them in order to support that. Um, there's a notation here just to include references to past CB1 resolutions on Governor's Island and their positions. That's the 2018 draft scope of work, the North Island rezoning, et cetera. And then no on citywide engagement and public response in that Governor's Island falls within our community district, but it's a citywide resource that's well used by the community from all parts of the city. Engagement to other community boards has been insufficient. We've we've been uh, on, on quite a campaign to engage with other community boards. We've gotten comment from other Manhattan boards and Brooklyn boards and elsewhere. 
CB1 held a robust public hearing with many speakers and has received substantial written comment from both CD1 and citywide. Most of these comments have been in opposition to the scale of density and development and in favor of preserving parkland open space and recreation on the island. And finally, this is a public asset and the community has been scantily involved in the development of a plan for this public resource. We have reached the end. We have hit everything that we have. So now I am assuming based on our conversations thus far, we are not at a yay. We do not have a position to say, correct me if I'm wrong. I know some people are going to yell at me on this. This is not going to be a no, because there are some people who under, who believe that there should be something done. So that leaves us with two other options that we need to consider and vote with. As we started at the top, it is favorable with conditions or unfavorable with conditions. It is sort of clear to me that this is an unfavorable group as a, as a, as a, largesse from what I'm hearing and that all the conditions that we put in here, we would hope that the, we would be able to have a more clear picture and have changes made in order to go forward because as it lists currently, we are not in favor of it. Anyone arguing with me that it should be something else? Tammy, I agree with you. This is Laura. Okay. Do I hear any other things? So with that, Diana, is that clear on where we're going? If I'm understanding you correctly, we're talking about a no and less and then a list of conditions. Okay, yes, that's clear. Is I just want to so, Yep, go Alice. Um, you know, I think I just want to make clear that I think many of us here know and adore Governor's Island. I'm certainly one of them and that the community board has been consistent in their support for the trust to transform the island. And, you know, I think it's safe to also say that the community board fully appreciates the need for private public relationships to fund this endeavor. Um, and, you know, you could argue that we're sort of at the beginning of the process, maybe and not so much at the end. And that some of this is just you, as we can see here, you know, a need for additional time and information to answer many of the community's concerns and interests. Um, this is, in fact, the 1st time we're looking at this really and engaging on this proposal. So, you know, it, there is a sort of. Inherent call for time I'm hearing here and, you know, we're having some excellent conversations. That are happening now, but have been it's the first time that we're really having these conversations. And so I think, you know, we should just keep in mind that the vote is not a vote as to whether we agree with the governor's islands, you know, I would argue very laudable mission to turn this island into a vibrant mixed use community for 365 days a year, et cetera. But what we are voting on is whether this particular zoning proposal meets the needs and interests of the community and, um, you know, in voting yes means yes, regardless of conditions. Right? So, you know, did, you're saying yes to open space considerations, waterfront accessibility, all of that or no, uh, you know, with conditions and, you know, I think everyone should just be clear that it's not a vote about the mission of the of the trust. But rather just that particular proposal as it stands today. That's I just want to make that clear. I, I, I feel sometimes we, we lose sight of what we're really voting on. I like I, I like the way you phrase that. So I appreciate that. There are hands up, so I'm gonna go Andrew, Bob, Patrick, and then Vicky. Tammy. Oh, yes. Hi, Andrew. Sorry. Sorry, just a, a procedural question for, for the record. Does there need to be a vote of the committee or no? Yes, this okay. is our last chance and our final votes on the 22nd. Technically, our window closes on the 28th and then it moves on to borough president review as part of the Euler process. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Bob Schneck. 
I just want to say that I respect the thinking behind the project and think it's a really ultimately good direction for Governor's Island. And if not that plan, are we going to wait another 10 years for another? And I think this one uh, has a lot of momentum behind it. And I would like to see more about how it would really fit together. Okay. Uh, Patrick, then Vicki. I, I, I just, I, Respectfully disagree, Sammy. That it was a completely negative group. Um, I heard some positive comments, and so what I think would be helpful is to perhaps get a straw poll of those who may be yes with conditions versus no with conditions. And secondly, um, as a preface to that, if Diana could just again sort of reiterate the difference between the two, or maybe even sorry to pick on you, Allison, if you're still with us, but Allison from DCP to sort of explain for the members the difference between the two votes, and then. All sure. members to whether they're one place or another. I'm happy to I'm happy to have Diana do that. Um and Vicky. And I'm happy to take a straw poll. Vicky. Thank you, Jim. I want to follow up on Patrick's comment. Um the idea is that we should be clear about what we're voting on tonight. Please make it clear um if we're voting uh no or yes and to what. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I'm, I'm, Diana. Yeah, and and I'm I'm going to respond, Allison, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, if we're if we're talking about the difference between a, a, a yes with conditions or no unless, um, to me, a, a yes with conditions is obviously more favorable, and it sounds more favorable with a list of of things that we 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 would like to see along the way, a list of requests, et cetera. Whereas a no one less, I think, implies obviously less support there. Um, I think there's an acknowledgement that that some need or the, or the burden of proof has not quite been satisfied and that there's a series of deal deal breakers, essentially, and those are the conditions that must be met in order for the community board to be able to lend its support. That's always how I think of it. But Allison, I'll turn it over to you for any any city planning perspectives there. No, I think that's really well said. and and. I mean, to be honest, the what, what really is the the substance of the meat is is the is the conditions themselves. Um, the favorable or unfavorable, or that it's as it's now phrased, versus the yes or no with. Um, it's it's really just like I always see it as kind of the general impression of the community board. Does the community board have a favorable um, view of the proposal or an unfavorable view? Uh, kind of setting a tone before we're diving into the questions. And thank you, Allison. And I do think that we, I think we've heard from a lot of people thus far um, that we know something needs to be done, but this isn't it yet. So we're hopefully trying to get to a point that if we put all these conditions in and it came back to us, I, I think it'd be a highly favorable. Some people would always have an unfavorable aspect, but I think it'd be a very different thing. Michael Kettering, um, going to about to take a straw poll. Yes, I just wanted to to reiterate um, some of the comments made in support of this. Uh, I think that this uh, Governor's Island has planned from the very beginning to be self sustaining. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Battery Park City should realize that you would never have anywhere near the quality of the parks you have there with if it weren't for commercial development that was really subsidizing that and the notion that well the, the public will get what it needs is is rather naive because in this day and age with serious fiscal issues um the idea that somehow government will just write a check to do all the the, the programming and maintenance for for parks uh indefinitely is misguided and and that's the very first thing to go in a budget crisis is things that you know you you keep your your police you keep your fire but parks they're the very first things to go so i i feel very strongly this should be a a a resolution in support with conditions well we're going to take a straw poll so everybody can kind of land where they want to um let me before we do the straw poll, are there any other pitches? 
Okay. I just, want to, I just want to remind the community board that, um, you know, I, and I, you know, with voting on a lot of these things, we, we don't really vote on a lot of zoning, but. You know, I think we have to keep in mind that yes is yes and no is no, you know, conditions apart. And so, you know, I, I think as well as it was stated, you know, by Allison and Diana, you know, if it's primarily favorable, then that seems a fair yes. And if it's primarily not favorable, it seems like a fair no. It isn't as if this vote is going to stop things from moving forward. And nor is it a vote saying that you're not in favor of a public private partnership in funding the island and having, you know, and having obviously money get there. So I, I, I'm having a hard time tying that together. Again, I really hope that this community is looking at the zoning and keep in mind that, you know, you know, that's what you're voting on, not whether you're going to support the mission of the trust by funding this. That's not what's being asked of here. I, I don't interpret it that way. So I just am going to reiterate that point. Well, and then that that actually puts me to a good thing to remind people that it will say on this resolution that we support Governor's Island. We support its 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 goal for um, working with the community and finding a way to improve its sustainability. There's no doubt that everybody wants that because we want to be able to support. The schools on the island, we want to be able to support a lot of things, but whether or not this particular zoning application is the right way to go is where we're voting. Okay, so on a straw poll for the committee, I'm going to get a committee list in a second. Sorry. Diana, you want me just to pull a committee list up or you got it? I got one. Okay. So, uh, we're, the first question is whether or not we are going to a favorable with conditions, that meaning we like this zoning plan except for conditions, or unfavorable, and we want a different zoning with the conditions. All right, Patrick. Well, I, I encourage a yes with conditions, but obviously I recuse. You have to recuse. Yeah, I was like, what do you say? All right, Fern. Sorry, having problems getting on. Um, I'd say no. Okay. Uh, Megan Brown Kennedy. Okay, we'll come back to you, Alice. Uh, you're recused, but you have to say it. Sorry. I've been asked to be recused on the basis of the financial interests that I may have there. Gotcha. Vicki? No. Osa? I'm confused. So um, this yes. this is a vote as to whether it's a yes with conditions or a no with conditions. And if it's a no, that means you do not support the current zoning, and you'd like to see something different. Here are the conditions that are that we want to revise and look at. So that if it's a yes, vote. if it's a yes, then yes, this zoning looks good. Here are some conditions that we think. But it's it's a yes to approve the zoning. But the no, okay, but the no with conditions means that if they agree to those conditions, then that turns into a yes. Correct. Okay, then I vote no with conditions. Okay, Jason Friedman. We can tell it's late. We've all been here forever. <laughs> Jason, look, we'll come back to Paul Goldstein. I'll go with the no also. Michael Kettering. Yes, with conditions. Okay, Joel, I don't see. Bill. Yes, conditions. Joe Lerner. No. Okay, Colin. No. Okay, uh, Anthony is excused. Uh, Laura Starr. That was conditions. Okay, Brittany is also off tonight. Uh, all right, so uh, Michael Kramer. Kramer, I see you. 
<laughs> no with conditions. Thank you. Luis is not here. So that we go back to Megan, uh, Megan Brown Kennedy. My three-year-old is waking up and crying. I'll be back. All right. Thank you, Megan. So that puts us at Jason Friedman. Could we call the question? Let's call the question and go. One, uh, two, three, four, five. Yep. All right. So now this is for the resolution as we've gone through it tonight. Patrick. Oh, he can't vote. Recused. He's recused. Fern. Is it no with? Yeah, no with conditions. I mean, no one less. Sorry. So yes, okay, you're, you're a yes. Sir. Okay. Okay, uh, Alice. We Rick, just get recused. Recused. Vicky. Vicky. Keep going. We'll come back to you, Vicky. Sorry. No, no, no. I already said no. I apologize. Okay, so that's in favor for no one less. <laughs> she was in favor for no, but then okay. she just doesn't. She doesn't want anything. So I think she's voting no to everything. Yes, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. So is that a negative vote? Opposed? Negative vote. Anymore. No. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, Rosa. If they make the changes that we are requesting, then it would turn into a yes. Correct. That's not the issue. <laughs> but the so the question is, are you voting yes on the resolution? Yes, I'm voting yes on the re the resolution is all the points that we just discussed, right? Correct. So then, yes. Jason. Conditions. Jason. Thank you, Rosa. Okay. A uh, gold scene. Yes. Michael Kettering. Abstain. Abstain. Uh, Bill. Same as uh, Mike, abstain. Got it. Joe Lerner. No. Joe. No. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, no. No for nothing. Gotcha. Okay. You're opposed to it. Colin. I'm uh, voting yes. Uh, I'm so what I'm doing is I'm voting yes to a resolution that says no with conditions. That, that's, that's what I'm doing. Okay, yes. thank you. Michael Kramer. Yes. <laughs> okay. For the record, okay. And for the record, I'm voting and I'll be a yes. All right, is this the new record? One, two. You're not done yet, Paul. Let me count them up. One, two. Three. <laughs> Jason Friedman's here. I'm not sure what's going on with him. All right. We have six in favor, one recusal, two abstentions. Is the applicant for the second item on the agenda still here? Oh, there is. There's no second That's item on the agenda. That was a joke. Oh. I, I think I I would have killed you. Oh my God. It appears that the, there were six in favor, two opposed, two abstaining, and one recused. So, um, oh wait, no, um, Patrick and is it's, recused. Alice is recused. So there's two recusals. They don't count. This is Allison. Can I ask a quick question? Pass. Thank you, pardon. It it does. Um, I don't know. Uh, did Jason Friedman ever come back and vote? He's here. You did Megan. Uh, Megan texted me her kids screaming, so she can't vote. Uh, Alice, Joe Lerner, uh, did you Joe, have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly clarify uh, the two votes opposed. Um, that is because those individuals preferences would be a straight no instead of a no with conditions. Is that accurate? No, those two would did a yes with conditions. This is a no resolution with conditions. They wanted a I think we yes. Better clarify. Previously Wait, said no. I think you better oh. clarify that. So, yeah. yeah. This wasn't 
I thought Joe and Vicky were no, they don't want any changes of any kind to the existing. Exactly. That's what that Correct. Was, so, so they voted no they voted no on this resolution because they don't believe in the conditions, they don't believe in anything, they don't want to see anything. So they don't support anything that supports changes at all. Right. So they're saying they're opposed because they don't they're not in favor of the vote you know, with conditions. Yeah. I'm, Correct. I'm yeah. voting no. Because I feel it's a pack. The way they presented it, um, if little alternative, you, you either take their way or no way, because they can just reject everything we can. We will say. Yes, no, exactly. And I would like someone when it finally goes through to analyze uh, what additions, if they did make any. Will anybody do that? I'll do that for you, Joe. Thank you. You know, you're not only being a great uh, uh, director, you are a great reader. So you-, you. That's a <laughs> lovely compliment. You're just top dog <laughs> all the way in my eyes. I agree. That's awfully sweet, Joe. So Allison, you understand this is, as, um, this is where we- Tell Allison. So, sorry, I, I understand the, the votes. Thank you. Yep. Okay. And with that, if Can nobody you, has, yes. How, how the heck are you going to explain this to everybody in the full board meeting without going another three hours? Uh, I will take care of that because. It, the first thing we do is explain what the vote was, and it's really it's very easy because it's just here's here everybody's heard the proposal. Here's what we're saying why we don't agree with it. Here are the changes we would want made, and so we voted unfavorable unless you make these changes. And some of us, Pat, Pat. Some of us who don't belong, who aren't part of this committee and sat through this, can be supportive of this at the right. future meeting. Okay. It's been, been five hours already, and I, I'm sure you're going to have like tons of questions at the <clears throat> yeah. Oh, but there are a few of us here who stayed the, stayed for the for the duration and can add to it at the larger meeting. And you should get an award, Susan and Pat, I have to say, and everybody else, <laughs> particularly if you're not on the committee. Thanks. Well, yeah. well it's thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. So thank you to everybody. It's been a lot of hard work. If we have a, if you have changes at the full board, we'll make them there. Good night. Yeah. Bye. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Yes. I just want Bye, to thank the thank the <laughs> Governor's Island Trust and and yeah. and Allison and 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 Diana and and thank George. You. Big big thank Definitely. yous. The outgoing president because he's outgoing. And thanks to our chair for hurting all these cats. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye. Well, thanks. Enjoy the snow. Take care. Bye. Diana, let's stop the recording. <laughs>